Time having arrived, uh, Tuesday, February 18th, 7 o'clock, Finance Committee meeting is here and it's uh, in order now. Uh, before we uh, take agenda item number one, Councilors, I'd like to uh, wish a happy belated birthday to our uh, new colleague, Councilor at Large, Shana Barnes, who uh, reached the ripe old age of 29. <laughs> Again? Since we're on birthdays, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege in which the old, wise gentleman <laughs> from Ward 2, today is actually his birthday, yeah. oh. and he's nowhere near 29. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Council Monaghan. Hey, I will let you know that uh, Council Barnes was born after Council Monaghan graduated from high school. I don't, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I will say, uh, Constance, I saw a picture of our esteemed colleague on the internet today. Uh, he had a lot of hair back in the day. I don't know what's <laughs> happened to him, but uh, without being said, Madam Clerk. Look at a crew cut and the crew bailed out. Agenda item number one, please. Order appropriation $7,000 from the Planning Department, Ordinary Maintenance, Buildings and Grounds Maintenance to Personal Services Overtime to cover the upkeep of parks on White Avenue, Crescent Street, and the GAR Park. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, James Cassiri, Superintendent of Buildings. Good evening, Mr. Cassiri. Good evening, Councillors. In all my years here, this is the first time I ever got to go first, so thank you very much. Very well. <laughs> um, this is uh, a simple transfer so we can maintain the parks on the corner of uh, Crescent, Montello, and also the GAR Park out here. Motion recommend favorable. Second. Second. The motion is made properly seconded. I recommend favorable to next week's full city council. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Mr. Kassiri. Yep. Uh, Madam Clerk, number two, please. Order. Transfer of 15000 from building department full-time to personal services overtime for unexpected expenses for emergency calls during the evenings and weekends due to aging city buildings along with severe winter weather and emergency calls from fire, police, and for after-hours inspectional services. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Connor, Chief Financial Officer, and James Kasseri, Superintendent of Buildings. Hello again, Councilors. Uh, this is um, transferring money from personal services other than overtime into overtime so we don't run out at the end of the year. We've been using quite a bit of overtime. Mr. Chairman, just one Council. question. Thank you. One question. It says for after hour inspectional services. What have you had to do or will you have to do for after hour inspectional services? Uh, well, that would be when there's fires or car crashes oh, okay. into a building. We had two of them this weekend. Naturally. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Move to approve. Second. Again. Again. Motion is made. Uh, properly seconded. Favorable recommendation of full city council. All in favor? All opposed, that motion carries. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good night. <laughs> Madam Clerk, number three, please. Order, transfer of $10,000 from the Planning Department personal services other than overtime to the Board of Health purchase of services to fund unanticipated expenditures. The transfer will pay for the services of two nurses, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, and Louis E. Tataglia, Jr., Executive Director of Health. <coughs> good evening, Mr. Tataglia. Good evening, Councillors. Um, what you have before me is a request for $10,000. Uh, this is an unanticipated expenditure. I have a public health nurse that is uh, injured on duty, and I need to pay um, the services of two part-time nurses to take her place. Move for a favorable oh, recommendation. I have a, I have a question. On the motion, Councilor Bonds. Yes. Um, where are these nurses going? Where, where, where are their services to be rendered to? Mm -hmm. um, they, <coughs> excuse me. They do the uh, uh, work mostly in my office. Plus, they do DOTs, direct observation therapy, at homes for TB patients. Okay, and TB patients are tuberculosis. Oh, okay. TB. Oh, oh, TB, not TB. Okay. I have. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Tataglia, why do we need two part-time to replace one full-time nurse? Well, first of all, when I say part-time, these are limited like five to ten hours per week. Uh, they're not part-time like 19 and a half hours each, each nurse. Okay. Uh, and one may not be available. But uh, most of the time I have both of them working in my office. Okay. Any further questions, Councillors? Seeing none, motion was made. It was properly seconded for a favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, number four, please. 
Order that the city hereby accepts the provisions of the Mass General Law Chapter 40U enacted as Chapter 26 of the Acts of 2010, an act relative to unpaid municipal fines, invited Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Louis C. Tataglia, Jr., Executive Director of Health Department and or Code Enforcer. Councilors, before we talk about this, I, I was remiss. Uh, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, had given us written correspondence. Unfortunately, he can't appear here tonight. He had another engagement, um, so I wanted to state that for the record. And then also, uh, agenda item number four, we have some handouts before Mr. Tatalia. Uh, just for, uh, for information, councillors, I filed this order. Uh, there's a summary here. Other municipalities within the Commonwealth are adapt adopting Chapter 40U. Attached is what the City of Boston did. And in essence, what it's going to do if it's adopted by the City of Brockton, and Mr. Tatalia can address this, it's another tool in the toolbox for the city relative to quality of life issues such as housing and sanitary code violations. Uh, right now, if the city of Brockton uh, slaps a lien on a property relative to code enforcement, it's not a superior uh, lien such as a municipal lien. Uh, if you adopt Chapter 40U, uh, it has a lot of teeth uh, because what can happen is it will be a municipal lien, a superior lien, and eventually it would be attached uh, and potentially if it wasn't paid off, the fine wasn't paid off, it could be a tax taking down the line. The city of Brockton is not, uh, in my humble opinion, in the business of trying to take property from people, but this uh, has worked extremely well in the city of Brockton. It's worked at other municipalities that are neighboring to us. Mr. Tatali, I, I, do you have any input relative to this? No, I'm uh, not very familiar with this at all. I just, first of all, I just received this finance committee meeting agenda maybe three or four days ago. Um, and I'm, yeah, I wasn't even familiar with the order that was placed there. I know, um, over the course of the years, every time I come to finance, I'm sorry, uh, budget hearings, um, I've asked that the city um, adopt Seriously. local regulations so you can place fines um, as a lien on a property. Basically, that's what it is. That's the big, my biggest question is, yeah, who is going to be the hearing officer? Who is going to take care of all the paperwork associated with this? That would, that's, that's a great question. Uh, other municipalities have, uh, have had the town manager or the, or the mayor or the city council um, in the city of Boston. They worked in conjunction with the mayor to designate a hearings officer. That would be yet to be determined. Uh, step one would be for the council, if they choose to, to adopt it. And then it has to be worked out, and the ordinance would have to be drafted through the ordinance committee as well. Uh, it really is an incentive for, uh, for residents to, uh, to upkeep their, their property. Uh, I know it was discussed last week, and Mayor Carpenter, who's here tonight, uh, was aware of it as well. So it really is a, it's a beneficial incentive to the city of Brockton. Councilor. Oh, just when you're done, I just have a few questions. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you could actually answer this question, uh, Mr. Tataglia. But... Is there, is there any number to date how many, um, or if there's a pot of money for these fines that have already kind of accumulated? Is there a way to get that? Well, I don't know if we're going to start fresh with the fines that we start with, or are we going back uh, and take, e I mean, you're going after fines that people don't live in the city anymore. People have lost their houses. They're not, they're not in the city anymore. I don't know how far back you want to go, or can you go back? How do you start, let's say, from day one? Okay, and actually, um, to follow up on that, I guess. I, I, mean, you, you, I don't know if you can because you haven't given the proper paperwork. They've well, been sitting there for years. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I didn't know if, if this could be a retroactive kind of thing, and I guess I would ask Councillor, you know, if this was something that yeah, we could Yeah, point of information, other cities and towns have done it once it ena is enacted. They haven't gone oh, back. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and also, too, um, well, you just actually said you're not really familiar with this, but going forward, is it anticipated that the, um, the gentleman who works with the BRA now, the dilapidated in, um, identification properties person, um, will he also be involved in this as, as he seems to be yeah, doing I mean, that right now, identifying You have homes. health department and code enforcement officer, but every department in the city writes tickets. So it, it, would, it should be an all-inclusive, whether it's the animal control officer, the building superintendent, or whomever. Okay. Whoever writes it, other than the police, you know, the police ticket. That's, that's a different ball game. Okay. Um, and also, too, um, uh, Mr. President, does this also allow, I guess, some sort of um, 
punishment to the big banks. I understand if a property is owned by you know just a regular person, but what about like a big bank or something? It would it would be whoever the legal owner of record whoever is. The owner right. is. So if there was a foreclosure, let's just say Bank of America owned it, right. it would be attached, and they could potentially lose their interest in the property. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Counsel, did you have a question? I uh, actually, and perhaps Councilor Brophy. I mean, excuse me. The good Brophy could step forward and explain to us. <laughs> <laughs> explain to us how liens are collected. Out of sight, out of mind, huh? Exactly right. <laughs> now, how they forget how liens are collected now and how fines are, are collected and uh, where they go. And f f as of right now, we have not accepted this. Correct. Any fines that different departments write right now, what happens to them? The vacant and abandoned property fines and the registrations. Um, what happens is the bill is created, it's put on the MUNA system uh, on the third quarter bill, as with any of the assessments that are out there, whether it be water, sewer, trash, whether it be the vacant and abandoned, uh, whether it be demolition, those bills are then committed to the real estate bill. So it would only be on the third quarter real estate bill for the prior fiscal year. So those are things that we already have basically, the way we wrote those up, those are not fines, other items that are fines do not go as a... No. Once anything's no. unpaid on your, on your real estate bill, it can then be leaned, correct? Um, it would become part of the real estate real bill estate itself. Bill. So it, it becomes a lien at that point. At as that far point. as some of them, you know, the, the water, sewer, trash become a lien the day after they go past due. The day after the due date, it becomes by force of law a lien on the property. Uh, all we're doing is committing it to the real estate bill. Um, Vacant and abandoned, it's more a fine for not registering it, or it could be um, they've gone out and done some work on the property. And that one will then become a lien when it's put on the real estate bill. And then, and you may not actually know, we have other fines that are written that are not... That are fines. That are that fines. Not, and they won't, don't go on the real estate bill. They go into the general fund when they're paid. Yep. Uh, for uh, for I mean, parking they, tickets and, and all? Parking tickets, yep. They don't go on. Uh, actually, what happens with the parking ticket is um, it could get marked at the registry. At the registry, but that's not, that does and not It doesn't go on a real estate bill. On a real estate bill. And I guess the only downside of this, and it's not really a long-term downside, is some people actually hold off and pay those because they feel they get the tax deduction on... There, are, because there have been known to be people who will let things go on their real estate bill to use it as a tax write-off. But Even though they if the IRS up. finds out about it, then they'll have to deal with the IRS. Okay, so it's not legal to do that, but nope. but many people do that as a way to uh, get the deduction. But they pay the interest still, correct? They pay 14% interest on uh, the water sewer, 14% interest. So that goes right onto the real estate bill, and then it starts collecting 14% interest on the real estate bill. Okay, and really the tool that this would be is when when the when they need to sell the building, when finally an owner is selling a piece of property, this will have to be settled with the city at the time. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, then and actually, uh, again, once it is on the real estate bill, it becomes, takes on the characteristics of the real estate bill, in which case, if it goes unpaid, then we can perfect the lien at the Registry of Deeds, and if need be, if nothing is done about it, then the city can foreclose. And then let me just ask the question, you know, the, I always look for the law of unintended consequences. If we were to do this, and you have the person who truly is, you know, I mean, the tool I think that uh, uh, Chairman has filed this for, and I agree, is really for the people who are the, 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 the true violators of, of taking care of their properties. And in most cases, we're looking at the, the larger, the people we are still <coughs> having even trouble tracking down who owns the building until right. they're ready to sell it. Um, what opportunity do you have to work with, you know, the, the little old lady who's alone and just can't afford to keep, can you help? How can you help that person in that case? Because we're not looking to hurt people, but we're looking to... Unfortunately, uh, in the role of the tax collector, very limited uh, in what I can do. Um, because there is an issuing authority that actually creates the bill. Uh, all, most bills are committed to me to collect. Therefore, I can't... I, I mean, we accept partial payments. Um, so other than working out a, a payment plan... It's not even a formal payment plan because, I mean, those don't really exist until a property is in tax title and, okay. you know, it's basically you can pay what you pay, but if it goes beyond a due date, there's going to be interest yeah. charged on it. Okay. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, and thank you for filing, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Counselor, Chairman. Just, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to answer your question, uh, the appeal process, okay. if it was uh, an elderly person, uh, the appeal process was that person would go for the, in front of the hearings officer and a decision is rendered, like a non-disposition. That's how it would work. Counselor. That was actually my question. Is there an appeal? Counselor Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a motion that we recommend this to the Ordinance Committee. Second. A motion's been made, properly seconded, to send this to the Ordinance Committee. All in favor? All opposed, that motion carries. Councillor Azak. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move number nine out of order, please. Second. A motion's been made, properly seconded, to take number nine out of order. All in favor of that motion? All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, number nine, please. Resolved that the Executive Director of the Board of Health be invited to appear before a committee of this Council to discuss possible regulations relative to frying oil management and disposal systems in restaurant operations management technology that would protect the public from a spill such as we recently discussed by the Council and that would increase employee safety. Invited Louis E. Tatalia, Jr., Executive Director of Health Department. Good evening again, Mr. Tatalia. Good evening, Councilor. Do you have any comment on this? Um, yeah, of my 22 years as a health officer, we've never even bothered really with um, waste oil. It's just, a, it's just the cooking oil that's put in containers and taken away by another company. I think where your problem lied is you had a spill on city property, It's my understanding. Uh, probably what you should have done is a something in place between who's ever in control of the city property and who's ever using that city property. There should be some type of agreement if you're going to put uh, anything on that property, especially a waste oil container or, or anything that could be hazardous. Um, I've, restaurants have, have used the uh, Baker commodity uh, type of container for the most part. Uh, some people use private barrels, just a regular 55-gallon drum. And, and again, I, I probably have heard of five spills in the last 10 years. Um, the one who would tell you more about the spills would be the fire department. We get it secondhand. But there are not that many spills. This happens to, to the one that brought this to light happened to be on city property, I guess, and the city ended up paying the bill. This resolve was filed by our colleague in Ward 7, uh, Council Azak. Thank you, Mr. Tataglia, for being here this evening. Um, so from what I understand, there are no rules and regulations that the restaurants need to follow. These barrels don't need to be locked or put in a certain place? No. They don't? No. Now, what about, um, I mean, this did happen on uh, city property, and that's why there was an issue, and it was yes, I understand cleaned that. up. But, um, I mean, it could happen again in... I would like to see something done so it doesn't happen again. But when, it, when you're saying having something done, um, like what are you talking about? You can't put these, you know, you can't have them put tanks in the ground for waste oil. That's worse than, that's worse than having a spill if you have a problem with tanks. No, I'm just maybe an ordinance or something. For the restaurant owners to be responsible for the barrels and for the grease that's in them, I mean... I just think that well, they, they do they need are, to have they rules are and regulations. Now, they are now. It's just that what happened and has happened twice over uh, behind the bad bus terminal uh, within a year. You've got vandalism over there. And both times, both a barrel and a baker's commodity container was tipped over. Correct. And that's why I'd like to, um, I mean, maybe hold the restaurant owners responsible. So if there's rules that they need to follow to have these barrels either be contained inside the building or... I, I mean, don't think the fire department will let them inside the building. Okay. What about, um, what about, are they locked? Are these barrels locked or how do they... No, but even if you had a locked barrel, if you had a spill... <coughs> It's not going to be contained. It has to be completely airtight for that to, 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 to not spill. Okay. I mean, so, what, so there's nothing that you would suggest to, that well, could help um, this not I mean, happen again? We can, you know, I mean, we can check, check closer. I have uh, Bob Butler, my sanitary inspector here, and basically there's, there are a number, and Bob can tell you there are a number of different ways in which this oil is collected. As I said, 55-gallon drums. What else, Bob? Come on up. 
Yes, they actually uh, have 55-gallon drums. Of course, the dumpsters, uh, they actually put it back into the oil containers that they actually buy it out of and then uh, sell it back to uh, bigger commodities as well. Those are usually the mostly the, the three main ways that they get rid of it. And how is this picked up? Like, there's companies that come and pick it up, or who picks up these barrels? Yes, bigger commodities is pretty much the number one uh, company in this city who picks up all that stuff. Because the other question was the, the barrel, they could... We weren't really sure who the barrel belonged to, so I mean, so the restaurant, so the city doesn't have to take on this e expense. I understand it wasn't taxpayer money, but it was still an expense that was paid out yeah. by the city. And that was not, oops, sorry, Baker Commodities um, container. That was just a 55-gallon drum. Okay, so my uh, question again, I, is I there guess any way? What's, I guess what's going to happen is we're going to have to monitor um, the, 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 the waste oil drum, the, particularly the ones that have the drums. 55-gallon drum, they just have a cover on it, lift the cover up and throw the waste oil in there. And, and for the most part, those are restaurants that do not have that much waste oil. Okay. That 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 55-gallon drum could take about a year to, a year to be filled. So I mean, you, is it also being monitored how much that these restaurants don't dump the grease also down the drains? I mean, that causes that's, problems that's, also. That's what these containers are for, is so all the grease doesn't go down the drain. So one year fills one of these barrels. Is that what? You're, one it takes up to one I'm, year. I'm to just guessing. It oh, depends okay. on it depends on the amount of. Uh, cooking they do. Some places, you know, the big users have the big friolators. And that, that's where a lot of this comes from. Correct. Friolators and your, your woks, your Chinese woks. That's where most of the grease comes from. I know my, um, up at George's Cafe, my brother's restaurant, um, his container's emptied uh, every three weeks. That's a fairly, I don't know, they're about maybe 50 to 75 gallon containers. Okay, so there's nothing that you would suggest that we could do to kind of to take my, care of this matter? My thing is, we, and, and, and again, Bob does all the restaurants, so we have a handle on it right here. I mean, what we can do is check, we will check the oil, the, the waste oil drums to make sure they don't get over too filled and tell, tell them to, that they got to have it pumped. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. You all set, Yes, Counselor? thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the issue obviously was this is considered hazardous waste, correct? No, only when it hits the ground. Well, that would be hazardous waste. <laughs> yeah, but when it's in the container, it's not hazardous waste. No, it's not a hazardous waste substance. It's not a hazardous waste until it hits the ground. And then, because it goes into your storm drains. Okay, a little trouble with understanding that one. It's a, this is I guess a, this is DEP telling us. Well, exactly, and that's what are there DEP regulations on? I mean, obviously there are. The issue came. Fire department came down and said you've got to notify. The money was we had to call in clean harbors or somebody to clean it up. Uh, I mean, it was pretty expensive for a 55-gallon drum worth of and hazardous waste, you know, is a, I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's going in your stomach, you're cooking food, so, you know, it's probably a pretty benign, but it is considered hazardous waste. It's actually considered a food. Am I right, Bob? Yes. It's considered a food. B but it is. It, let's say it spilled out, it didn't spill onto city property. You said you know of five or, five or ten other spills and a few other spills in the last few years. According to the fire department. Do you know if, the, if those restaurants then had to call in a hazardous waste removal no, company? No, I'm not familiar with the spills. Okay. Only, but only that they had uh, uh, maybe one or two calls a year. And uh, Lieutenant uh, Williams could answer that question more thoroughly than I can. Okay, we may need to talk to him, but I mean, it but seems even, to me. Even, even if, if now there was a spill, there was another spill at Joe Angelo's, okay? And I guess what, there was a, 
Joe Angelo didn't own the property, so he was not the responsible person. That wasn't the city property. I don't know if they ended up uh, going to court, and uh, I know it was like a $12,000 cleanup, and uh, it was paid by someone. It may have even been paid by Baker Commodities, because I guess once, by law, that waste uh, cooking oil, waste cooking oil goes into the container. It's now the property of Baker Commodities. And someone spilled uh, the, the whole container. Well, I guess that that's, uh, first of all, in your opinion, once this stuff gets dumped, it's not dangerous. No. no. So really it became a financial issue. And so we do need to identify some way where that restaurant was responsible. Well, if it's on your, yes, if it's on, like you have over there, you have two restaurants over there. Right. Um, I think they even have dumpster enclosures on the city property because I believe the city property goes right up to the back back wall of their building. I don't know if the city, I think the city took a lot of that land um, when the bat bus station was made. Building when they did the bat bus. Um, but there needs to be some way then to at least identify who owns that, who's responsible. Well, the person, this is why I'm saying if something is on city property, then the person who is responsible or the department that is responsible for that property, whether it be the BRA or whether it be the parking authority or whatever, should know about it, should have a written agreement exactly. if something happens there. And should they fence it in? Should they have a pressurized lock lid type of barrel? Um, they, okay. they so the, there are ways like that that they could uh, have an agreement, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know how, how it worked out as to who was going to pay for it, so I, I can't. Well, it basically came down to the parking authority could not prove who, who it came from. Right. I think they know where it came from, but couldn't prove it. So they paid for it because they had the fire department insisted on, on a hazardous waste cleanup. It was $11,000. So... You know, I'm glad my colleague filed this because it seems to be there has to be some way to say you have to secure that. You can't leave it out back. If it's a hazardous waste, you know. Well, it's if it's on city property, yeah, you, you, even, no matter what it is, you, can, you have an agreement. Yeah, I mean, if it's on city property, then in my, uh, they, dumped, they dumped it on city property, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, yep. there, there has to be some way. We'll have to come up with some way. And I'll work with you on an ordinance. There that, that has to be some way to identify and to. Uh, you know, if they're putting it out behind their building, but that's on city property, that's an issue. But somebody else could not put, you know, we allow people to put their trash on the sidewalk, but they couldn't put hazardous waste out on the sidewalk, correct? No. Which is essentially what, what happened. Well, it's, it's a different ballgame also. You got the, you're talking about a back of a building, not, not a sidewalk or anything, just city property. Yeah, but the back of the building, if it isn't theirs, isn't a place for them to put it. They need Absolute, to right. make that's arrangements what I'm for it. It goes, from what I understand, up to the building. Now, that's something else that uh, you could probably check with the uh, parking authorities where that land stops, also. Yeah, but not just in that case. I mean, there's. But the even if you had, a, even if it was on, the, even if it was on their property, you have a spill there. Exactly. It's going it's, on to city. It property. goes on to city property. Right. Exactly. All right, thank you, and good to see you up and around, too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dubois. My, my questions were answered. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Tartaglia, good to see you. Um, it just seems to me that, the, that there should be some review of the frequency of these types of spills and, um, and what, how do you mitigate it? So are you, is there an ordinance to request that, that these owners have a special kind of container and then what the cost would be. We don't want, I wouldn't want to burden a small business with an additional cost if these spills are infrequent, but I feel like what Councillor Asiak is asking for is some kind of analysis of the situation and then how do we have recommendations. So I don't know, uh, not that I'm volunteering to be on this committee, but it seems like it's somewhere in the process we should be able to do some quick analysis, no? Well, the only ones, um, the Baker commodities containers are fairly self-contained. They are containers that are real commercial containers. I think what you, you're talking about are the barrels. You can get barrels, I believe, that have uh, a locking lid on them, but I don't know if that's a pressure lid. 
It's going to be a pressure lid. I see. So maybe that's worth investigating, and, and oftentimes counselors will do some of their preliminary research and bring those ideas to the department. I, I mean, I think they should, you know, have the name of their establishment on the barrel also, mm -hmm. and the address of the bar on the barrel. Mm -hmm. right. And my other concern is if a business is a budding city property, but they don't have a place to store this kind of material, I wouldn't want to prohibit that business from having a place to to, to store this. Um, this waste if in fact it will impact their business negatively. So I'd be interested if we move forward on some kind of ordinance that we're caref careful not to put a business in jeopardy. Uh, and then on a side note, who keeps track of the quantities of this organic waste in the city? Does The does people who collect it. Okay, and, and we does, and the city has access to that information if, um, by request? You get it piecemeal. There is a lot, you, you have to remember now at one time, this waste oil, people were paying to take it away. The, these companies now are, are, are paying to 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 uh, take it away. They're, they're, they're charging. They're, the well, no, they're not charging. They're, they're paying the the restaurant owner a fee for that waste oil because that's now a recy That's it's not waste oil. Actually, it's a recyclable. Okay, that's what I was thinking of too, because I know there was an earlier proposal that I had a conversation with DPW about with this sort of digestive, uh, using organic waste from homes and businesses that could generate power without um, no negative waste and that this cooking oil could be one of those sources. So that's why I was sort of interested in what the quantity looks like. But that's a That's, that's a, a different, different ball story. game. You're yeah. talking the using the waste food uh, with an antibiotic. Um, Correct. Digestive system. Digestive right? system, right. I was and, uh, told by a consultant that um, based on his estimations, there were there's enough waste, organic waste in the city to power every single city building um, at no cost and then could also be used to sort of supplement um, electricity costs for, for all residents. But um, okay, well, well, thank you for um, answering the questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a few more. Just to be clear, you, did you say that your officers go around periodically to check to make sure that the, the drums or the containers aren't overflowing or that they're not well, in jeopardy? Well, they check the backs of the building where the containers are. It's part, every, of, it's part of the routine inspection. Okay. How often is that? Twice a year or whenever there's a complaint. Okay. That's, that's mandated by uh, the state, uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Okay. Okay. And um, uh, with, uh, is, is it possible maybe even to, because I, I share the sentiments of uh, Councilor Stewart not wanting to burden or unnecessarily burden the business owner that this might happen to, especially if it's something like vandalism, because you're saying now that at least there were of the five that you've seen or so, two of them were right over here. So it, it, it's something with the, the place or somebody or something vandalizing. That's how I kind of see that. Oh, so it's kind of a dark area over there. And, and right, it's isolated. People gather there right. at night. Right. You know. well, hopefully not for longer. But um, so is there a way to maybe, uh, and I know we're talking about, you know, brainstorming, I think, ideas on how to address this. So, so that everybody kind of, you know, ends up a winner, but maybe giving the business owners some kind of like a ticket or, a f or like a fine, but kind of like a like a college parking lot fine, where it's not that you don't really have to pay it, but if you say, for instance, if you rectify it in 30 days or something, it'll be rescinded or, or something of that nature. Well, just we would give them an order to to correct. It, it's a written order. As far as a fine, once a fine is written, a ticket is written. It's a ticket. Well, I mean, I, that, that's the thing. I mean, I, I know that somebody should be responsible for eleven and twelve thousand dollars worth of cleanup on this, um, but I, I'm just trying to think to best balance that. It needs to be cleaned up because, like you said, it's yeah, food been, until it hits the ground. Have, and then and it's they have been paid. You know, it, it, it's 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 like um, any other type of um, <coughs> oil spill. This is even less hazardous. I mean, you can you can take a uh, a tractor going down the street, if that hose bursts, you're talking 50 gallons of oil that are going to go on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's hydraulic oil, that's not uh, cooking oil. But I'm, 
you've that been very happens, careful to that be... That happens more than what we're talking about uh, tonight. Right, but you, you've been very, very careful to um, be specific, I think, in, in what you're saying. I'm trying to listen very clearly. Uh, motor oil or, or that kind of oil spilling in the street is very different than what you said. Like, this is considered food until it hits the ground. Then it's hazardous, hazardous waste. So, I, I mean, I just wouldn't want to... Um, compare those right now, just kind of staying in, in this one vein. So it's not, it's not as serious as, as that motor oil, or, or like a, an oil spill? No, it's, it's not as serious. That, if it got in the drains, even if it's what, 40, 50 gallons, by the time it got to the Taunton River, it would probably be dissipated. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor Isaac. Um, I just have a quick question for you. How hard would it be to get these restaurants to label the barrels um, with, so at least we know whose barrel it is if there is an, another incident? It's not that hard. We can start tomorrow. Well, I would like to see that. First off, I think when their name's on the barrel, they will also take, pay attention so they'll take care of it um, so it's not so you know, left out there. Yep. So I'd like to see that happen until we figure something else out. I mean, in, in the long run, we're all just trying to save money. If we can foresee something happening, then, you know, we'd like to. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Councilor, can I entertain a motion? Councilor Isaac. Um, motion to recommend favorable. favorable. Recommendation to full Second. Council. Yes. Motion's been made. Properly Second. seconded. <laughs> favorable recommendation. All in favor? All opposed, that motion carries. Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Thank you, Councilors. Have a good evening. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman? If I might, Mr. Chairman? Councilor. Um, I, I think number four, the item that we were discussing in regards to 40U needs to go back to full city yeah, council and then go back to my... Councilor Rodriguez. Yeah, that's what I was about to do, uh, Councilor. <laughs> um, in light of the uh, procedural... Uh, awareness that was just brought forward. I'd like to make a motion to withdraw the uh, motion to recommend number four to ordinance. Second. Motion's been made to uh, improperly second to withdraw that and not send it back to ordinance. All in favor of that? All opposed? Motion carries. Councilor. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, now make a motion that we recommend number four to the uh, full city council. Second. second. <coughs> Favorable recommendation of full city council. Uh, properly made, properly seconded. All in favor? That motion carries. Number four, Madam Clerk, is not going to ordinance. It's going back fable to full city council. Thank you. Number five, please. Order appropriation, $37,916.10. Consultant stipend, $17,314.50. Sale of sick days earned, $20,601.60. From the fiscal year 2014 budget, police personal services other than overtime, as currently appropriated to pay the fiscal year 2014 cost of the agreement between the City of Brockton, the Brockton Su Police Sup uh, Supervisors Union, and the former Chief Emmanuel Manny Gomes, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Mayor, good evening. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good morning. Been a long day. <laughs> good evening, Mr. President, members of the Council. Um, I, if I can, I'll give you just a kind of brief overview of this, and then I'll let the CFO handle the specific numbers questions. Uh, since he gets paid to crunch the numbers. Um, this is uh, in front of us as an appropriation at because it's the result of an agreement negotiated with the union. There's a couple of things here that I think can be a little um, confusing. We're not really looking for an appropriation of the full amount. This is broken into two parts, a stipend and then the buyback of sick days. The stipend itself is already in the budget as part of Chief Gomes' salary that was budgeted for the year. Um, the stipend represents the difference between Captain Gomes now stepping down to serve as captain between his base salary as captain and what his previous salary was as the chief. We were contractually obligated to pay him that money, but now that he has stepped down to captain and is back covered under the collective bargaining agreement of the supervisor's union being compensated as a captain, we could not just simply pay him a higher rate than the contract calls for him to um, earn as a captain. Uh, therefore, in, in uh, working out with the chief, the financial aspects of ending his employment agreement, we needed to put that as a separate compensation item and negotiate a side agreement with the union 
and Captain Gomes as to how we would pay him that difference between the captain's pay and the chief's pay. And so we arrived at this consulting stipend, which is simply the difference that we owe him between the chief's pay and the captain's pay. But we did add some duties into the agreement that he, in, es in essence, earning this difference by agreeing to work with and consult with the new chief. So that's the portion that is the, the quote unquote consulting stipend is the difference in salary simply between chief and captain. The, um, the buyback of sick days was the other contractual obligation that we had to fulfill. Those are strictly his sick days earned as the chief. And now that he returns back to the union as a captain, we needed to, in essence, settle up for the non-union sick days that he earned during his time as chief so that he could resume his place as a captain in the union and pick back up his other accumulated uh, time that he has earned over as many years of service to the Brockton Police Department. Um, those sick days, he was due whether he ended his term as chief this year or he ended his term as chief next year, he would have been compensated for those sick days. So those are the, the two portions of the agreement. One, the difference in salary. The other, unused sick days that he was entitled to be paid for under his chief's contract now that he was ending his service as chief and returning to the union as a captain. So that, that's the overview, and I'll, I'll allow the CFO to handle the very specific questions, if that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Right. Mayor. Uh, Council Stewart. Excellent. Um, Actually, it may be for Mr. Condon or Ms. Cruz. I just have a question about, uh, I mean, this is mine, isn't it? so the yes. buyback in sick, sick days is $20,000. Yes. Or $20,600, yes. which is a lot more than many people make in a year going to work full time every day. I'm not debating the legitimacy of that or if it's earned. But oftentimes, how much of this buyback it, uh, includes rollover in the sick days from year to year? It's, the, uh, it's a buyback of sick days that would have been earned from the time he was appointed as chief until the end of his chief's uh, service. Got it. So it's, all right, so and. It's two so years worth of sick days. I got it, okay. And so it's not um, time that wasn't taken within a year that's rolling over to a. No, it's, he, he didn't take any sick days during his time as chief. And okay. the payment is for the days he earned during his time as chief. No carry forward of any days that were on the books for him prior to when he was serving as a captain or a lieutenant or a sergeant. All right, so, um, so in, in the contract with the chief, and, and I asked specifically about this contract, but in general, in terms of city policy, are you required to exhaust your sick days annually, or you can carry them over as much as you? No, you are allowed to carry them over without restriction, uh -huh. and they're allowed to build up without limit. Uh, the amount at the end of your service, if you uh, retire from the city's uh, employment, uh, you're allowed to sell those sick days back. There's a formula which varies a little bit by contract, and then there is a cap no matter what the calculation is, because normally I think that there's a, a number of days you've got to get, get rid of half. Once you look to sell them, you know, you're allowed to accumulate them without restriction. Once you look to sell them, I think it generally requires you to sell or eliminate half before you can get any sell uh, back payment mm -hmm. and then there's a cap on what the value of that payment is regardless of how many days are left uh, and that varies by contract. So in the case of the uh, police supervisors union, um, I don't know what that value is by off the top of your head, is it 13,000 maybe or something like that? And I think on the department heads 12 or something? Yeah, it, it's, it's anywhere from 12 to 13,000 typically depending on whether you're an ordinance employee or or a uh, union employee mm -hmm. as to what at the end of your service you can sell sick days for. And it, today many companies require you to exhaust your sick days on an on a annual basis or you lose them. Is there, is there a reason why we're not taking that approach? Uh, it's never been taken. I mean, so there's the basic reason. And the city has no short-term disability policy. So in the, in the union contracts and in the ordinances, there's a allowance for earning sick days at the rate of one and a quarter days a month. That's what the ordinance in the contract says. And there's no restriction on the buildup of those days for the use of them. The only restriction is at the end of the time when you're looking to sell them. There's also a benefit in some of the contracts which allows people who have days in the books to reduce their uh, volume of days with an annual sellback or to get a bonus if they haven't used uh, any. 
and does it make sense financially for the city to adopt a rule that basically for new contracts that require that you exhaust your sick days so we're not paying these large lump sums yeah, at you, the end you, of I mean, it would, it would be a bargaining matter, and it's, it's um, uh, as part of the give and take, it would be, it would be something you could put on the table, um, but it's, it's not something we can simply implement because it's, the, the benefit itself is defined in the contract. So to change that benefit, we'd have to get agreement at the table. Great, and uh, I think I, I know the answer to this question, but so this type of change applies not exclusively to present employees, but can you not make this change for new employees who haven't been hired yet? Can, can you not make this a new requirement for? You could, I mean, as part of the, but it would, again, it would take bargaining at, the, take at bargaining the table. The okay. Because the, the benefit in the contracts today doesn't provide any restriction as to whether you're a new employee or an older employee. In the police union contracts, at one point, there was a benefit which was for 100% uh, sick leave sale at the end of your, um, your working days. And there was a negotiation which capped that. It doesn't exist for employees hired, I think, after 1994. And the number of days that were accumulated by people at that point were frozen for that, for that benefit. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stadinsky. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Okay. Jay, if you could, we're talking about a chief of police contract. We're not talking about a supervisor's union contract. We're talking about a contract signed by then Chief Emmanuel Gomes. Why, why is the city going through all this and bargaining with the union? The man is the former chief. We owe him that money. We're supposed to cut the check and pay him. Well, we don't uh, want him anymore. That's the way it's got to be. I don't understand it. Okay. Uh, well, my understanding of the reason for it is that first, the, um, the decision to pay the chief a different rate when he returned to the force as captain than the union collective bargaining agreement provides for a captain required some mechanism for paying that extra money. And if we were to, to have paid the chief that amount of money for the balance of the days due to him in uh, the remainder of his contract, because remember what was being done here was an, we were seeking to buy out the remaining days of a contract. The chief had a contract which carried through until the end of March 2015. We, so if you're going to say that contract is valid, we needed to honor its provisions. So in some way, you had to do it, either pay him today, which would have been more expensive, or pay him over a couple of years, at least for this fiscal year, or pay him over a couple of years, which is what we're doing with this uh, stipend. And when we decided to do that, we now entered into the doma domain of uh, a collective bargaining agreement with the supervisors union because we couldn't pay a captain a different rate than the other captains were getting paid. Uh, you, you kind of lost me, and, and I, I know we have other people here who might be able to help me with this, but we go into bargaining. When you go into bargaining, it can be impact bargaining. Mm -hmm. They have a right to grieve if we've taken something away from them. We change their working conditions, they have a right. We change the working conditions of the former chief. I don't know why we don't cut a check and let him go back and be a captain. He's willing to do it. He's agreed with it totally. That's the way it should be done, to my mind. If somebody can help me, of the rest of the group out there, please step up Take to the yeah. lectern. Chief, let me try to shed a little light on this. Uh, I agree with everything you said, and that was absolutely our intention all along, and from the very first conversation I had with the chief was that the city would fully honor its commitments to him under that contract. That's what you do with an employment agreement, and that's the only way to handle it. This mechanism was developed through the conversations with the chief um, because I did not want to hurt the chief in any way. He felt it would be more to his advantage um, that if we just cut him a check that would actually harm him a little bit potentially in terms of his, um, uh, how it would affect his pension down the road uh, as opposed to if he just took a lump sum payment which may not have been considered pensionable. So he requested that the, that the check be carried out over the balance of his term. So it was, not a, it was not a lack of respect for the chief. It was honoring the contract that said we had to pay the money that was due him. Um, so the, um, and I'm not the lawyer and I relied on, on the... Um, you and I agree on that. We're not lawyers. Right. That's why we're asking questions. Right. So I, 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 I hold you very, very, very in high esteem for the fact that you want to do the right thing. 
and, yeah, and, and it, so that. along that, what the advice was from the solicitor, and I'm at a disadvantage tonight because the solicitor is not here to give you his advice, but to the best recollection I can give you of it is once Chief Gomes stepped back into the union, into his captain's position, his pay as captain has to be exactly as stipulated by the collective bargain agreement with that union. So you're correct that at the time the agreement's being made, he's not in the union, but in order to affect the agreement when he steps back into the union as a captain, that's what brought the union into it, and we had to have a side letter with the union that would allow us to compensate him at a rate higher than what the cap contract calls for for a captain. So he's back in as a member of that union. Correct. And he, he is they, a captain. They're demanding that we give them more because we have to give him more because of honoring his contract. Am I missing I, a point there? Well, it was in order to be able to pay him. It, it's an unusual situation because he's the yes, first I chief agree. that he's I, the I'm first chief that I can. Have somebody from the auditor's office. I've question, Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes, sir. If if we set up a separate item, line item, that entailed the $17,314.50. Could we pay that weekly to Mr. Gomes in, in, as compensation for the contract? I mean, numbers and numbers and numbers. I'll, I'll defer to the city solicitor. That was the advice that we were given. I, I just, that once again, I, I lodge you for being, for standing up and, and doing the right thing because it is a contract for everybody in the room to know. If you don't do it, he ends up paying us all out. I understand that. Right. But I just, I just think that uh, to have to write it up like this, and it, it's burdensome to you, and, and, and also to Jay, the, to, to uh, Ms. Cruz, the, the whole right. team. And, Counselor, just to clarify, this 17000 is not an additional payment. This is money that was already in the budget for his yes, chief salary for the that, year. Yes. It's shown here as an appropriation because, and the President can explain it better than I can, because there was an agreement with the union involved, we needed to bring it back as an appropriation. But that money is already in the budget. Well, okay. Thank you very much. And again, if the solicitor were here, we'll be happy to make him available to your counselor to answer your specific thank questions. You. Thank you. Uh, thank Mr. you, Councilor Stenesi. Councilor Dubois. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> um, I would just like to say that if we're going to be getting rid of or any contemplation of getting rid of um, paid sick time, then we should definitely have a short-term disability package. I mean, we, we don't, this isn't, this isn't, um, you know, pre-union labor times. Um, you need one or the other. Mr. Condon, would you come to the podium and just address that, and then I'll move on to my other questions? I mean, is, is that accurate? You need one or the other. We can't What's just not allow our, our employees to not have short-term options. What are they going to do if they get hurt on they get hurt and then they're out of work for four weeks? What are they going to do? Well, if they use up their sick days and they use up their vacation days and their personal days, they're on a no pay status. No, but what I mean is, if we were, if your your new agenda were to bargain out um, this ability to roll over sick days, I would assume that the union would force you, or you as a good employer, the city would offer some time a short-term disability benefit. We took I mean, away it seems cruel uh, to do otherwise, Well, right? I, don't, I don't know what we do at the table, Counselor. I mean, as, as it went back and forth, I'm not sure where we'd be on that. Okay, thank you, know, you very but much. I, I, we, don't, we don't have a disability uh, policy right now for their benefit. Okay, thank you very much. And then um, my only other question is, you know, I'm going to support this because even though it doesn't seem to be... Um, Unroll, rolling out the way I think is appropriate and respectful to the previous chief and um, his great work for the city. Um, I take, you know, I, I think he deserves the money, and so I'm going to vote for whatever way you guys decide to give him that money. Um, but this makes me more concerned about um, other plans that will affect the bargaining units um, of the supervisors and the patrol officers and how unexpected costs could come up when those impact bargaining requirements come in. So if we create a commissioner of the police department, a civilian commissioner, and both the police union and the supervisors union say that is the, the, the light switch for impact bargaining, how do you even know how much that's going to cost us? Have you guys given any thought to that? 
Well, in the case of the uh, police commissioner, I don't think the city's position is that there is an impact, uh, a cost element with respect to impact bargaining with the union. Uh, the impact bargaining has to do with the, your, what is the effect of the decision, but not over your, the right to make the decision, and, and I don't think that necessarily be a cost item. In this particular case, the cost item arose because we needed the union's agreement to this particular structure, and their uh, willingness to grant that agreement was only if they got paid some extra money in that. That's a fiscal 15 cost. I, I share your concern. Every time we make a change in any of these collective bargaining units and in their work conditions, we run the risk of their saying that you need our permission to do some of that and we'll only grant it in the case of giving, um, giving some money. There's no doubt that always is a possibility. I only ask that because that is what Lieutenant Williams said when he came before the Ordinance Committee meeting and it got me very nervous about potential mm -hmm. additional costs. Yeah, that, so that's thank a possibility. You. Thank you for the latitude. Thank Councilor you, Councilor Dubois. Fellowman. Councilors, any questions? I have one question. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just had a quick question. In turn, and I support this 100%. Um, in terms of the consulting stipend, um, Captain Gomes is now remotely located at Brockton High School. Correct. Is, how is he going to be consulting with, with uh, Chief Hayden? Do you know? Well, I, I can tell you that they've already consulted several times, and in fact, uh, there was a meeting between the, a fairly lengthy meeting between the uh, three of us in my office regarding transitions. So, um, I agree that the fact that they're not uh, both uh, located physically in the same building, I think, with the nature of both of their jobs, they're both very mobile people, and they don't have any trouble communicating with each other. And I, I will tell the council for a fact that uh, that that. Uh, Captain Gomes uh, has been a true professional in every sense of the term, and he has been of as much assistance to Chief Hayden as possible, and I know that they've met on several occasions, including a meeting in my office. Great. Thank you. Moves to recommend favorably. Uh, second. On the motion. I, I had a question. On actually, the, mo on the yeah. motion. Well, since approved. you asked that question, I actually had a question for Mr. Condon about, uh, I was going to ask this another night, but uh, since uh, the chairman mentioned that uh, Captain Gomes is now assigned up to the high school. We agreed to add a lieutenant to the high school right. that was paid for by the school committee, school department. Is the school department paying us the difference of having a captain at, up at there? At this or? point, that agreement stands as it was written, I believe. You don't mind, I'll give you the answer because I've been through that recently. Uh, between now and June 30th, Councilor, nothing changes. We're obligated to pay Captain Gomes his captain's salary, and you're correct. Uh, Lieutenant Mills, who is the uh, school police liaison, is his salary is paid by the school committee. So, and in fact, the whole position we only agreed as a past council to add that lieutenancy to run to, to for that job. Right. And it's based on, and the union agreed to, based on the fact that the school department pays for it. Right. So I so I think that between now and June 30th, there is no issue. I think it's something that uh, the city side and the school committee. We'll both have to look at and come to an agreement on in terms of the upcoming year. And I can't get too specific on personnel matters publicly, but it's something that's certainly on the radar screen that I think we all realize uh, needs to be addressed uh, during the upcoming budgets. Okay. But between well, now and July well, everybody 1st. Everybody realizes that because yeah, that's between, a pretty expensive, uh, pretty expensive person that we've put up at the high school now. Correct. And is, uh, the agreement was that the school department would pay for that position. And I think that we would uh, resolve that for July 1st. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Council Cruz. A motion was made. Favorable recommendation is properly seconded. All in favor? All opposed. That motion carries favorably to the full city council. Madam Clerk, number six, please. Order. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Councilor. I was wondering if we could take number 11 out of, uh, out of order. Second. <coughs> Motion's been made to take number 11 out of order. All in favor? <coughs> All opposed, that motion carries. Councilors, that was my resolve. I'm going to step down. Councilor from Ward 3 is going to fill in. Madam Clerk, will you read number 11, please? Resolved that representatives from the Coalition for Social Justice, the Green Justice Coalition, and the local utility companies come before the Finance Committee to discuss and outline the protocol's purpose and desired goals associated with proposed energy initiatives and opportunities within the Commonwealth, and to discuss the viability of the increasing residential, small business, and municipal energy efficiency programs outreach in the City of Brockton, and to report sufficient program data to allow for assessment of the program's effectiveness and to grant municipal officials access to said detailed program data. 
invited Jean Lawton, member of Coalition for Social Justice, Jeremy Schenk, Deputy Director, Community Labor United, Alex Papali, Massachusetts Clean Water Action, Stacy Rubin, ACE, Amy Vivac, Massachusetts Energy Consumers Alliance, Beth Lonergan, Lead, and An Lead Analyst, Residential Strategy of National Grid, and Elizabeth Salucci, Director of Energy Efficiency, Columbia Gas. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. If I could, um, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Salucci notified uh, the council, um, the clerk's office, she's unable to attend tonight, um, but if any of the other invited guests are here, um, I filed this resolve uh, because I thought it was extremely important based upon the city of Brockton and the residents. Um, the energy efficiency program uh, can be really a beneficial uh, program. Um, and I, and I, you know, I know there was some um, confusion on what the purpose was. The purpose is spelled out there. Um, I, I, I think the people that are invited guests that took time out of their schedule to come tonight uh, are going to be able to bring some important information to us that we can convey back to our constituents that we serve. Uh, Mr. Lawton, good evening. Good evening, Councillor. How are you, sir? Fine. How are you? Good, thank you. If you could, um, again, just uh, state your name for the record and if you could maybe just explain um, why you're here tonight. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Gene Lawton. I'm a volunteer for the Coalition for Social Justice. We're a grassroots activist group um, involved in making things better for the working man and the disenfranchised. Uh, part of this resolution is geared towards energy efficiency and weatherization. As you know, uh, about 50% of the homes, or over 50% of the homes in Brockton are 50 years and older, which, um, you know, so they're not as updated with the, the green technologies, and I believe that the uh, energy efficiency factor is probably as low as it could be, and I'd like to see that change. Um, we have some groups here that are as interested um, City Life, I don't know who's actually here because of the weather, but City Life, uh, the Family Center, Community Connections, uh, the Coalition for Social Justice are all together teaming with the other groups that are from the Green Justice Coalition, which is a statewide uh, coalition. They're in the North Shore, Metro West, the Berkshires, and here in the South Shore. Um, basically, we have a three-pronged attack that we're trying to do this with would be on the low energy or low income energy network, which is basically what it sounds like. It's geared for uh, uh, the lower income stratus. Uh, we have the part that we're trying to introduce into the South Shore, which is EN Plus, which is basically a very similar program, but it would be geared towards middle class workers so that those people that are maybe just making their mortgage and are a little bit over the, the poverty limit for the low income could still benefit from the advantages of this program. Um, these first two programs have absolutely, and I repeat, absolutely no cost to the city. Uh, the, the third program that we have is uh, being part of the green communities. Um, I've been working with the mayor's chief of staff, uh, Mr. Buckley, I don't know if he's here tonight, but um, going forward with that, there would be a partial subsidy that we would be coming back to the city council for and hiring a city manager. Um, my, my pals behind me here will get more into that. So we are going to speak on all three aspects of the program. And I guess they're ready to take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lawton. And, uh, just for, for point of information, Councilors, this, this Saturday, I actually, this past Saturday, I received a postcard in my mailbox from Columbia Gas uh, inviting uh, my wife and I as a homeowner to have a free evaluation for energy efficiency. And I spoke to my colleague from Ward 2 who his day job is working for Columbia Gas. And, and, and that's something that everybody uh, should take advantage of. And, and, of course, the first two endeavors that are free, the word free is always beneficial to municipalities. Um, but, I, again, gentlemen, if you could... Uh, maybe uh, state why you're here tonight and, and some of the, uh, the interest that you may have. Um, <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Thanks for taking us out of order, too. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Jeremy Shank. I'm the deputy director with Community Labor United. I just wanted to give a little bit of sort of context and background on, these, on the programs. Um, our friends from the utility companies can't be here, so I'm going to try to fill in a little bit um, on that. 
Uh, don't fact check me too hard, I'll do my best. Um, Community Labor United is a coalition of unions and community organizations that was started in 2007 um, in Greater Boston and we convened the Green Justice Coalition which is community organizations, environmental organizations and labor unions of which Coalition for Social Justice is our Bro Brockton partner. So we, we formed um, in 2008, we formed the coalition after the Green Communities Act was signed in Massachusetts. And so that's the key um, statewide legislation that, that basically raised the uh, more funds to pay for these energy efficiency programs that all of us as ratepayers pay into through a systems benefits charge on our monthly bill. Um, and so the idea for us is we are ratepayers, a coalition of ratepayers, and we wanted to make sure that the programs that were created um, had a focus on trying to reach the sort of diverse working class communities across the state. So there's, there's two main programs, Jean mentioned them both. One's the Mass Save program, so that's for everyone that makes above 60% of median income, which is roughly you know, $60,000 for a family of four. And the other is the Weatherization Assistance program, which is for people under 60% of median income. And that's the program that's totally free. And that's administered in Brockton by Self Help, and we've been uh, talking with them as well. So essentially, if you qualify for oil heat assistance, you qualify for this program for the Weatherization Assistance Program. And then we've been working hard to try to create a new program called the Efficient Neighborhoods Plus Program that targets people just above that 60% of median income um, who, may, who don't qualify for free weatherization services, but to make it a lot more affordable. But the Mass Save Program, you have to pay about 75% um, about of the cost is covered. So the idea is you can get a free energy assessment. They'll, that'll, that'll give you... Um, energy efficient light bulbs, it'll give you low to flow shower heads and that auditor will help you figure out what your house needs to save you money. And then the utility companies actually then pay for 75% of that cost for your house. And that could be anything from, uh, you know, caulking your windows, um, blowing in more insulation into your, into your walls and things like that. So we've been working hard with the Energy Efficiency Council that was set up when the Green Communities Act was passed to make sure that um, they're working with municipalities when possible to create um, ways of, of, of reaching communities, particularly um, working class communities and folks who maybe need a little more help to make sure this happens. We feel like cities like Brockton, we were just in Malden that, not that long ago, been talking to folks in Worcester, in Boston. These are the communities that need these programs the most in the sense it's where our homes tend to be the coldest, where we're making hard decisions in our neighborhoods about paying a bill versus paying rent versus something else. And if there's ways that we can cut down on our energy use, which is good for the, for the climate, but really in, in some ways the most immediate effect is it, it, it draws down your bill each, year, each month and there's real savings that are available for folks. And so what we're excited about with this resolution is to figure out how um, we can help as a coalition how the utility companies can work with the city to figure out ways that um, the city could partner with utility companies to make sure residents of Brockton know about programs, to make sure we work with utility companies to make sure that, that the things that you get in your mail are translated into the languages that, that people speak. Um, that if there are local groups that can be telling, um, we were working with the YMCA in Malden and they're talking with, with people who come into their doors. So the idea is let's make sure first, A, we all pay into these programs so we know about what they are and we know how to access them. We just feel like that's just a point of fairness. And the other is to make sure that there's um, local buy-in from municipalities, community groups to help people know about the programs, help guide them through the process um, to, to make sure that we can take advantage of these um, we think really great programs that exist, but like make sure people are actually using them. And I actually wanted to hand it over to Alex from Clean Water Action to talk about the State Department of Energy Resources is trying to work with cities to figure out ways that um, some of this stuff could be paid for and how cities can hire an energy manager if they don't have one already and become a green community that can open up, an official green community that can help open up other doors for resources to help um, pay for some of this stuff too. Good evening, counselors. Um, thank you for inviting us to address you here in this beautiful chamber. I'm, I'm more accustomed to the, the, the Boston, the brutalist architecture of Boston City Hall, so um, it's a nice change of pace. Um, um, you know, the, the benefits of energy efficiency are often lost, especially in communities like, like Brockton, where uh, more immediate, uh, you know, needs are, are, are pressing. And, uh, you know, our experience in places like Malden has been that folks who were skeptical about deficiency and, you know, alternative energy and that kind of thing 
um, change their minds completely once they see the benefits of their investment. Um, it, there's a benefit to, the, to, the, to your constituents who save money, you know, folks who live in leakier homes and are struggling to pay their, their food bills and so on, uh, but because they save money, uh, there's, you know, benefit to the environment, obviously, we're consuming less fossil fuels. Um, there's economic development, job creation, um, the, you know, the municipality can save, save money on the on, on a municipal electric bill and so on. Um, We've uh, we've been in conversations with the the Department of Energy Resources, uh, which administers the Green Communities Program. Uh, this is a program that was created through the the Green Communities Act that Jeremy described earlier uh, of 2008 that um, assists municipalities with uh, promoting you know energy efficiency in in, in all aspects of uh, municipal government. Um, there's resources set aside for municipalities to do this. Uh, through the state and as well as well as through the uh, utility company programs, uh, some of which were just described, uh, the utility companies the utility companies uh, administer the um, the mass save program, which is the the overall state program uh, providing you know, you know the the subsidies for uh, homeowners to do this work in your home. This isn't money that's coming from the utilities. This is money that we have paid in through a fee on our utility bills um, into a, a pot of money that everyone is supposed to have access to. What we found is that a lot of folks who are paying in, uh, renters, moderate income folks, uh, they're, they're don't, they don't have access to the programs. Uh, and, and so this Efficient Neighborhoods Plus program is a, is a way to create access for them. Um, the, the Green Communities Program uh, allows the municipality to take certain steps, allows Brockton to take certain steps to, to be designated officially as a green community. Uh, I had a conversation with Seth Pickering, who's the, the regional administrator, the regional coordinator for the Green Communities uh, Program uh, for the southeast of, of the state. And um, he had some really interesting things to say. Uh, there's not a, it's not a large cost, uh, per se, to, to be designated. Uh, there's a zoning change that would need to happen, the details of which escape me at, the second, at this moment, and I'm sure we can get more, more information about that. Uh, the city would make, need to make a commitment for um, efficient vehicle purchase for any, for any new vehicles being purchased. Um, there needs to be a plan to reduce energy use by 20%, I believe, over the next five years, um, which can be done with you know, academics uh, locally, or uh, perhaps some designating some, some staff time at, at City Hall. Right. Um, but these are you know, steps that are not that difficult to take. There's an annual designation uh, timeline. I believe October is the, is the deadline for this year. Um, so you know, if you were to, to begin in the next uh, month or so, uh, we can certainly ask the, the Green Communities folks to, to um, you know, just describe the best way forward. Uh, once the designation happens, there's a significant award to the city. Um, I asked for a, a rough estimate for Brockton. This is de determined by the, the size of the population as well as the income levels. And um, you know, the estimate that I got unofficially was something on the order of three to three hundred fifty thousand dollars just upon designation. After after which there's uh, further grant programs that the city the city could qualify for on an annual basis. Um, so this is just one of the many resources that are available to the city. Um, you know, on top of that, the energy manager program that Jeremy mentioned is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a grant program administered by the, the Green Communities Division that uh, allows the city to have uh, a staff capacity to apply for more funding through, through grant programs, um, you know, various resources from the utilities and, and from different state agencies, the Clean Energy Center and so on. The, uh, anaerobic digestion that Councilor Stewart was mentioning, that's a possible renewable energy, um, you know, there's pro pro possible funding from the, from the state and even possibly federal, federal funding for renewable energy. Um, so in any case, there's, there's lots of resources. The city really should be taking advantage of all of these. Uh, the Green Justice Coalition, Coalition for Social Justice, we're here to, to be of assistance and, uh, you know, please look to us as, as allies in, in your pursuit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Papali, uh, I'm sure you're aware that Brockton, uh, sure. I mean, Thomas Edison was in this building many times. His office was right across the street where Mr. Cooney's office is now, the Chamber of Commerce. And 
It was the first electrified street light uh, in the nation, a fire station, electrified doors in the nation. We have one of the largest bright fields uh, in the Commonwealth. So, I mean, I, I think we're at the cutting edge. Um, I, I think really the purpose of this resolve is very beneficial, as my colleague, Mr. Stanisky, just said. It really can do some good things for people that own properties. Uh, and, and if you're a tenant, I mean, y your landlord can, can benefit, and you, and you ultimately will benefit as well. But, I mean, the, the, the green... Um, the designation of a green community has its, you know, its pros and cons. I know a lot of developers don't like that concept because it's an upfront cost for when they do projects. But, but I, I, I think this is extremely important. I know the Coalition for Social Justice is, uh, I mean, they, they've come before us on quarry reform. They come before us on uh, predatory lending. So I, I jumped on this. I think this is a good thing. And I want to thank you. I know you guys traveled quite a bit to get here tonight. So I want to thank you. And with that, I'm going to send it back to the chair if there's anybody else has questions. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dubois. Thank you, Councillor Neary. Hi. So I think um, what you're doing is wonderful. I know a lot about uh, Mass Save and the work that um, all of you folks do. But I have one question that I ask every time Green Communities comes up. And so far, I haven't really been able to get um, an answer from someone that really understood. Because I've looked online and I've tried to find the answer myself but I haven't been able to do so. So green communities, there are a whole bunch of requirements and I'm pretty familiar with them, what you need to do to become a green community. And one of them is streamlined permitting for um, energy uh, facilities in your community. And so does that include natural gas and nuclear facilities? Um, I'm not an expert on the matter, and, yeah. and so I, I would defer to the, to the uh, regional coordinator, Seth Pickering. Uh, so I should contact Seth? Yeah, he, he in fact would know, he's right. So I will contact him. Absolutely, he's he's available. F you know, he was actually pretty excited about uh, Brockton potentially, uh, you know, c at least considering the matter, and uh, uh, described it at some length to Mr. Buckley, uh, the mayor's chief of staff, uh, who also seemed I've, I've put them in touch with each other. So my, the, my lack of getting that answer is the reason that I haven't championed that effort in Brockton. I see. So I'll, I'll make that clear if we him. can figure out the answer to that, I would love it. I'll give you my card and then maybe, you know, that could be something we would move forward with. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your Thank time. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moynihan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, as part of this program, did I hear you right that we would have to have, start, have another position in the city? Um, or a department, or is this? No, sir. It's uh, it's it's an option. You can you can apply for this energy manager grant if if the city's interested. Uh, what would be required is the is some some person designated to create a reduction in energy use reduction plan. I believe it's 20 for 20 percent over five years, uh, and that would it, it could either be done through city existing city staff capacity, or you know you could bring in an academic. Uh, as there's there's all kinds of resources who you know somebody who knows the issue, knows knows the matter. Okay, and th some of these grants you were talking about, like 300,000. What is that for? Is that just to give information about how to conserve and fuel efficiency, or what exactly is that for? The city the city would uh, does it would would apply would, would um, describe the the purpose of the grant. You can uh, there's a, if you look on the on the on the Green Communities Division website. It'll describe what all of the 123 communities that have been designated so far uh, are doing with their grants, with their initial grants, as well as the uh, competitive grant, uh, I believe is called, the, the annual grant that you're eligible for afterwards. Uh, it, could, it could be anything related to energy efficiency and conservation, uh, you know, anything that's very, very broad. That the city could use it for itself, like yeah. using money to, uh, I don't know, to get more fuel efficient trucks or things like that, could that be used for equipment? It's my understanding, yes, yes. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillors, any other, any other questions for? On your left. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, what is the actual website? Can you give us the website that people can get more information on? Uh, so it's, uh, it's the, yeah, I'm not really sure. It's, <laughs> it's the, it's run, it's uh, through the D Department of Energy Resources, DOER, which is uh, under the, E O E E A, the uh, executive office of uh, executive office of energy and environmental affairs. We're trying to find the website as we as we speak, but we can we can certainly get that to you. Um, 
But we have talked with the person from the Department of Energy Resources who administers the program, who is, is totally interested in following up with folks, so we can for sure get the, the website and the contact info and stuff. One thing we found helpful is when, once we understood, and I think one of the things we have really had to learn as a coalition is how to like figure out how to navigate all this stuff. It was much more complicated than we thought. We were like, oh, we want to create weatherization jobs for people and reduce people's bills, and then we, it would seem simple, but it got more complicated as we dove in. But um, as it often does. Um, but uh, the once we understood that there there was regional staff from the Green Communities Division, that his job is to work with cities in his geographic turf to like figure out what could be a good use of those funds and 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 um, to provide all those uh, answers when possible. So, and he's from Middleborough, you said? Yeah. Mr. So. Chair, if, if yeah. I could, uh, when, when, when that information uh, comes up, if Mr. Lawton can email it to me, he has my email, then I'll formulate it and get it to my, uh, my colleagues. Very good. With that being said, I'd like to make a favorable recommendation. Second. second. Motion been made and seconded. Send back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Goes back to the, um, back to the full city council. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank you. that <laughs> order. Thank you, Councilor Yaneri. Uh, agenda item number six, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilor. Uh, I'd like to propose that we move item number eight out of order. Second. Can you take that out of order? Sure. Councilor, uh, Councilors, uh, agenda item number eight, the motion's been made, properly second to take that out of order. Everybody in favor of taking out of order, raise your hand. If anybody's opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, number eight out of order, please. Order that the City Council approves the boundaries of the proposed Vicente's Tropical Economic Opportunity Area as displayed on the attached map, Exhibit A, more particularly described as Assessor's Map 52, Route 040, Plot 9, at 160 Pleasant Street, and approve the application for approval of the Vicente's Tropical EOA to the EACC in the TIF program. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Paul Sullivan, Chairman, Board of Assessors, P.M. Gurley, Specialized Secretary of Planning Department, Jason Barboza, Vicente's Liquors and Tropical Grocery, Gordon Carr, GMC Strategies, and David Ennis, Affirmative Investments. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Good evening, Councilor. Uh, so what we're seeking here is, uh, is for the Council to approve two basic uh, things. The first is the creation of a new economic opportunity area uh, for the uh, parcel over on Warren Avenue and Pleasant Street. Uh, that needs to be done so that we can execute a tax increment financing agreement uh, for uh, Vicente's tropical uh, market. They want to look to expand their, uh, their business, uh, continue the operation in the south end of the city, but then they want to uh, expand their business to create a new structure uh, on the Pleasant Street and Warren area. Um, they want to go from what to a 32,000 square foot store, uh, 24,000 of it's a currently abandoned building. It's on four and a quarter acres. And um, the basic uh, property value today is about $1,200,000, creating a little over $38,000 a year in property taxes. They would invest $19.5 million in this project and create 28 uh, full-time and 17 part-time jobs in the first five years of the project. It would be a 13-year tax increment financing agreement beginning in fiscal 17, and it starts out uh, from fiscal 17 to fiscal 21 inclusive at 100% of the increment, and then drops down for the next two years to 95%. So for fiscal 22 and 23, it would be 95%. For the next two years after that, fiscal 24 and 25 down to 75%. Fiscal 26 and 27 down to 50% for each of those years. Fiscal 28, 25%, and the last year would be fiscal 29, 20%. As you know, in these tax increment financing agreements, the basic property tax revenue that's coming to the city on the property is untouched. So we will continue to get that property tax revenue. What happens is, as a result of the investment that's being made, the city in time will realize additional property tax revenues on the value of the full investment. But early on, in order to help finance this project, the city will not be taxing a portion of the value attributable to that investment. And the portion that doesn't get taxed is on that schedule, which I just uh, said to you, 100% for five years and then dropping down. Uh, until it ends in fiscal 28. I believe that uh, Gordon Carr, who has 
been working with the Brockton 21st Century Corporation is here in support of it. I think uh, the folks from Vicente are here as well. Chamber of Commerce is here to support it. The project has been discussed uh, with Mayor Carpenter, and he's in support of it, and I'm in support of it. I think uh, for the many years that I've been working for the city, uh, that property has been a difficult property to see development on. It's uh, it, this as a um, as a grocery store basically for downtown Brockton provides something that's needed for the neighborhood. It provides something that would enhance our attempts to create uh, residential uh, properties uh, in downtown uh, Brockton, so that folks who would live downtown would have a place to go shopping. So all in all, I think it's it's a it's a terrific project. There is these are jobs are that will be primarily going to Brockton residents. And in addition, if you're going to have a tax increment financing program, the kind of program, this is the best use of it I can think of almost all the projects we've done. Because without this, I don't think that project will happen. And I think that property has sat in disuse probably for 30 plus years at this point. So I, I, I can answer questions and I think the uh, folks here as well can answer questions. But in my view, this is as good a project as we brought before you. Thank you, Mr. Conn. Council Monaghan. Yes, uh, Mr. Conn, you can stay out there, what, or whoever. Uh, just uh, my colleagues, I hope you really uh, would move this favorably tonight. Uh, I've been working on this for four years since I became a councillor. It's been there for over, like you said, 20, 25 years vacant. It's been an eyesore, unpleasant in Warren Ave. Uh, we've worked, I remember, with Mary Waldron and V21 for years. There were numerous bites at the apple for that property, but nothing ever came to fruition. And now the Barboza family has stepped up and finally got it done. There was a lot of issues going on with it. Uh, there was land from the church across the street that they had to, had to uh, make a deal with to, to get that property. They had to tear down the homes on that street uh, on the right-hand side of the property to give them that extra land. So this. Uh, it's really a perfect fit for that area, and thank God it's finally going to come to fruition. Uh, we just went through planning, and we just got a zoning variance. Uh, the neighborhood health um, center is going to be in there. Uh, there's a possibility of a uh, fast food restaurant going on. Well, that will go. We're not sure what that is yet. Uh, another plot would possibly house a, uh, a, a police substation with another business on it on that same property. So there's a lot of good things that could happen down that area, and it's going to really brighten up that area. And like we said before, that's the perfect fit. It's going to serve the community that is there right now. It's, it's regular food. It's also a lot, a lot of ethnic foods. It's going to serve the community that's living in that area now. So um, anyway, I'm just going to hope that uh, we pass this favorably tonight. And uh, we can give it up to Gordon Carr if you'd like to come up and explain the, the TIF at all anymore. But it's basically the same that you would have for, uh, I think, the same percentage as uh, the Crown Linen and or... And, um, uh, W.B. Mason, right. So I think it's we're in the same ballpark. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, thank you, Council. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm here on behalf of, uh, of uh, B21. I'm a, a consultant working uh, mm -hmm. with the 21st Century Corp. And the TIF Advisory Board looked very closely at the other TIFs that have been done um, uh, with other uh, projects in recent years, going back probably uh, four or five years. And this is very consistent. The, the length of time and the exemption schedule uh, is very consistent with, uh, with Crown Linen, uh, with W.B. Mason. They're never exactly the same, but the term and the uh, exemption percentages are pretty consistent. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. Councilor Neary. Uh, not, not so much. Good evening, Mr. Carr. And uh, I welcome you to be here this evening. And I, and I work with you on, uh, on other tests, including the one that we did for Bernardi Auto Group. So. Um, that one also comes as, as an important one is, is W.B. Mason and Crown Linen, and, and I think this one here is, uh, is definitely something that, um, I, I mean, I would never turn my cheek to a TIF anyways because I, I think it's, it's needed. And, and when taxpayers begin to say that, you know, you're giving out uh, tax inc increment, uh, you know, uh, programs to, to different businesses, yes, we are. We are because that's what creates business to come into the city and keep business into the city. And I think this one's very, very important. I commend my colleague from Ward 2 for for the many years he's worked on, uh, on this to try to do something at that corner. At one point, um, there was a former mayor that was, uh, was in the corner office some years ago, Mayor Fowler, who would have loved to have taken that corner and made that the public safety corner. That's what should have been done with that corner so many years ago. But unfortunately, money wasn't there to do it and, and wasn't able to, 
to, to get that done. But um, I just commend everybody. I commend the, the business people especially um, for wanting to stay here and, and to be a part of Brockton and, and, and to continue to see us progress and move forward because we are, we are doing that no matter what other issues we have in the city. This is a positive one. So I commend all of you and the councilor included. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Denapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, uh, gentlemen. We met the other night at the at the, uh, or, not ordinance committee, at the, uh, uh, I forget, the planning board and the, and the uh, whatever, but it was zoning board. I half dead tonight, thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, and uh, this is a, a great fit. We, we started to uh, rebuild the downtown area and you're gonna be part of it. And I, I talked to Mr. Roschetto from uh, High Park and he sends your regards. And uh, also, uh, I think this is a great fit for the downtown. The people in the, that live in that area will have their supermarket. And like what Council Monaghan said, this has been a vacant piece of property for, for 20, 25 years. And I'm looking forward to the supermarket, the grand opening, and we'll have uh, nice pictures taken and uh, take a nice tour of the store. And congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dapley. I'd like to pipe in myself, uh, Mr. Barbosa. Yeah. I want to thank you. This is a legitimate expansion. You're not leaving your primary location that, that you've done really great work on South Main Street. Um, and, and we've collectively supported Chapter 40 R Smart Growth Zoning, and this, this meets that parameter. Uh, the other benefit is Trinity Financial, because when those people move in there, this is going to be somewhere that they can shop, and it's really good. Neighborhood Health Center is going to be another benefit. So I just want to personally, as, not as a chair, as a council large, thank you for staying in Brockton and expanding your business in Brockton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Thank you. Entertain a motion. Um, uh, Mr. Barboza, did you have any? Did you have anything to say? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Council. Well, I just wanted uh, to give a brief history um, on Vicentes. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you know about us, but just want to give a little background. My father founded this company on North Main Street in 1994 in Brockton, across the street from the Hess gas station that's there now. It wasn't a Hess gas station when he opened. Um, and then in 2000, that's when he took over on Main Street. And then Main Street on South Main, that was next to Owens Ave. In that area, when we first moved in, we got the same type of critics saying it's a dangerous neighborhood. You know, I don't think you guys should go in there. It's risky. But my dad had a vision. He had a vision. He can see the potential in that neighborhood. And once we went in there, we really <clears throat> opened up, uh, you know, the lights there. And we created the traffic. And we kind of you know, the crime in that area started dissipating and moving away because we were there, because we were doing business. We was attracting um, customers from New Bedford, Providence, Boston, because we're Cape Verde and they don't, this is the only Cape Verde supermarket in, in New England. Um, we have um, customers from Connecticut that come down. So we attract a lot of outside biz business to the city and that's what makes us so popular and so great. And then going into um, Pleasant Street, we're not worried about the crime that's there. We're excited to, to move the crime away from there. And I'm confident that when we go in there, we're going to move crime. Business will come in. Business will invest because of the traffic and because of the volume that's there. We have two retail paths there. We don't know what's going in there yet. We'll, we'll keep it open, but there's options to kind of bring other businesses in and, and keep investing in the city. And like I said, we're from Brockton. I, graduated, I went to Raymond School first grade. I went to Davis School second to sixth grade. I went to South Junior High seventh, eighth. I graduated from Brockton High in 2005. And then I went to college and came back. And I want to continue investing in this city. And I will continue to do so. I, I played football from Bro for Brockton High. Um, and I, I, I love this city. And, I, and just to be part of this city and, be, and doing things here, I, I'm happy and to get this type of um, appreciation and feedback from you guys motivates me to, to keep doing more and more as the city grows and continues to get involved in the city. So thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair, Mr. Stewart, Council Stewart. I have a question, actually. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barbosa, for all that you're doing. And I wanted to thank my colleague for working on this for several years. Uh, just a question about... Um, the annual, so of the new, of the positions that are created, full-time and part-time positions, 28 full-time, 17 part-time, what's the annual, um, the total annual salary for those kinds of positions that would be reinvested into Brockton, if you have those numbers off the top of your head? Off the top, is, is, is difficult. Um, it, it all depends on the, um, the position, the role. If you're a, you know, a meat assistant or a meat clerk or you work in the meat department, those jobs tend to pay a lot more, um, $13, $14, $15, $16 an hour. 
if you're just a cashier, um, a a fifty nine dollars. So it all depends on what position and what role you're you're taking. And ask that question because oftentimes people um, you know critique the the tip financing approach, but uh, in addition to the property taxes that a business brings to uh, an area, yeah. you're also bringing a lot of um, income uh, that's spent in the city. And so I just think it's important to people to see the full spectrum of the investment by a company like yours. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's Cruz. Just a quick question. You may not know this off, yeah. off the top of your head. How many square feet do you win down at the old A&P building? For the, I'm old. It's the A&P building. 18, 18 19,000 square feet. And what will the new building be? It's a 32,000 square feet store. That's great. And, and it is great news that you're keeping the other open. And, Absolutely. Uh, I don't like to publicly say this, but I want to <laughs> commend Council Monaghan for all the work and the 21st Century Corp. I know how much work and how long this has gone on, and I know Councilor Rodriguez has been involved uh, also on this. And Absolutely. I'm glad you're here, and it's great to hear of a Brocktonian coming back after school and doing, staying and doing more work here, and good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Councilor Rodriguez? No, I was just... Uh, I was just wondering if, uh, if there aren't any more questions. I was just going to make a motion to move. Move favorably. for a favorable recommendation to the full council. Second. Second. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. On the motion. On the motion. Actually, I had a question. Sure. Do you already have a liquor license where you'll be selling liquor at the new location? We're, we don't. We, um, in the past, we bought a liquor license, and so we changed our corporate name to Vicente Liquors in Tropical Grocery. That was my dad. So we, ha we hadn't had the opportunity to, re to change that name again, but we don't advertise. Vicente's Liquors and Tropical Grocery, we look at it as Vicente's Tropical Supermarket. And then um, we sell only beer and wine. We don't sell single beers. Um, we don't believe in that type of foot traffic that comes in when you sell single beers. And even when we sold um, liquor, we try to stay away from nips because that attracts the right or wrong type of customers. So in this new location, um, beer and wine, it's family packed beer and it's just family, you know, wine that a family would drink at the dinner table. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, do you sell tobacco items? We don't sell single, like we don't sell single, they call them like Dutch masters. Everything's by a pack, but I'm looking into this depleting the whole, at least start off with that and then maybe look at cigarettes down the road. I know CVS is, so. Okay. That's, um, so, so wait, you're, you're saying that you're looking to get away from selling? Well, the, not, the, not the cigarettes right now, but as far as the t tobacco pieces that they buy, like the packs of Dutch Masters that attracts the wrong type of um, crowd that comes in, uh, into the supermarket. We're focused on selling food, and mm -hmm. I want to stay focused in that direction. I don't want to bring in the type of customers that want to you know, buy those types of I, I've only been to the market actually one time. Um, I, I don't, I don't, for some reason, I just... <laughs> I don't know that way, but um, lottery, scratch tickets, all that stuff. Do you guys have that? Yeah, we have lottery, okay. scratch tickets. So it's a full service supermarket. supermarket. Yes. Okay. Produce, meat, ethnic food, takeout kitchen. The fish foods. market that's next door is that yours it's too? Not ours. We will have one in our supermarket. Okay, fresh fish and fresh fish, absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Council Isaac. I had a question regarding the neighborhood health that. Will they be renting from you, or are they separate entities? No, they're just buying. They're buying their own property. Buying their own That's property. That's separate from us. Okay. Thank you. I just had one quick question. Uh, did you already close on the property? <coughs> the acquisition. Excuse me. Acquisition. Yes. Yes. You already closed. Great. Thank you. Council Dubois. Um, I'm so happy that you're expanding. So thank you very much. <coughs> I know sure. that that corner needs it. And there are so many churches in the area. I'm sure that they'll be very happy to have you there. And so good job for you and your dad. Thank you. Um, do you ha sell any organic food? We plan on having an organic produce section inside okay. the little store. All right. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council, a motion. Council, Just the one thing on the beer and wine, that even though it is a Cape Verdean ethnic store, basically, they, he has promised that he will be selling Guinness. <laughs> you know, uh, we better hurry up. The high holidays coming March 17th, so we better hurry it up. Uh, council, the motion's been made, properly seconded, favorable recommendation of full council. All in favor of that? All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you all. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Council Yanieri. Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we take uh, item number 10 out of order, please. Second. Motion's made, uh, properly seconded to take number 10 out of order. All in favor? I'll oppose that motion carries uh, number 10, please. And, and please remember, again, uh, Attorney Nazarella is not here tonight. His letter does uh, respectfully request that we may want to consider uh, continuing to the next FENCOM meeting where he'll be here. 
But again, there are gentlemen uh, here in attendance that could. We can at least open it if you choose to do that. Madam Clerk, if you could reason number 10, please. Resolved that Mayor William Carpenter, CFO John Condon, City Solicitor Philip Nasrella, and Mr. Mark Lindy, Executive Director of the Brockton Community Access, BCA, come before the Finance Committee to discuss the cable agreement and all terms, rights, and obligations defined therein between the City of Brockton and the BCA, and to further produce and discuss any and all amendments, including but not limited to a certain memorandum of agreement and or memorandum of understanding between the City and the BCA. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John Connor, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Mark Lindy, Executive Director of Brockton Community Access. Constance, just remember, I, I, I drafted this verbiage, but it was on behalf of each and every one of us as a whole, so we all signed off on this resolve. Uh, Mr. Connor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Lindy, if, if you want to come forward and speak, I, I would anticipate we probably will continue this when the attorney's here, but if nobody objects, the gentlemen are here. Mr. Mayor, if you want to come forward. I'll just make very brief remarks. Uh, we did, subsequent to the uh, last FinCon meeting, uh, the solicitor's office did locate the memorandum that there were some questions on and that was sent out electronically to all the counselors uh, within a few days. So the contract itself is about that thick. So if anyone would like a copy of it, we'll be glad to get it for you. And uh, honestly, since as uh, I was not serving at any time during the contract uh, being drafted or the memorandum, I don't think I'm particularly qualified to answer a lot of questions on it. But I know Mr. Lindy is here. And I know that uh, the solicitor, Attorney Nasrallah, uh, regrets that he could not be here tonight due to a prior commitment. But we will make him available to the council at a, at a future date if, if you would like to I'd do that. I'd make a motion to continue this so we can get that training as early yet. Second. Second. Could I, on the motion? Uh, on the motion, Councillor. Thank you so much. Um, I totally support my fellow councillors' uh, motion to postpone, but just on open council so I can get this on the record so they can be looking into it between the next meeting and this one. Could I just ask a couple questions? And the first is I would like to have a list, and I've already asked the auditor for this, but I'd like to have a list of all the funds that the city has received um, as a result of the license contract. I have read the MOU and the license contract now, so thank you so much for sending the, license, the MOU. And I got a copy of the license contract myself and have read it. And so it is thick, and I'm not an attorney, but it's, it's understandable, so that's good. And then, um, so I would like a, a, a list of all the money that the city has received since the contract was signed. So basically, Council, you're looking for a recap. You want to see what's come in and what's been sent over to BCA. That's, that's what I'd like to know. Sure. Um, I got some information from the auditor's department, <coughs> and I guess the way this money is being handled is not um, a way that I've ever been um, knowledgeable of, where certain money is handled by the auditor's department and other money is handled by the mayor's office, which is a little confusing when you ask for a detailed report and she can only give certain amounts because the other, other funds are um, under a different purview, which is a little confusing. So I would like um, just a, in basic language all the money that's come in and all the money that's gone out. And I would like it so you were sure that it was correct. I'd like it so you were sure that it was correct, so say like State Auditor Bump would come in and say, I want to audit this revolving count. No, I, that's, that's, we, we'll be more than happy to provide that, Council, right. and I think that we've actually already done that internally because I asked for the same type of review and I was very satisfied with the information I was given, but we will certainly provide it to you and the rest of the councillors. I appreciate that, but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I would like a narrative explanation of it, if that's um, what you have, because I would love that, but I really want to know the date the check was arri arrived. Right, no, that's, and I'm talking about the actual check data. Was, yep. because, I ha because I had asked for that already, and what I got was just, totally unacceptable um, and then so I would really love that and then um, when I don't know I don't want to attribute these statements to any one person because I don't know exactly who said it but last time the general you not specifically you um, Mayor Carpenter were, was here and we were talking about the funds being expended um, to pay for a staff member I was a portion told of a that, staff member's salary yeah. yep. 
I was told that the city has all, you know, has done it in the past. Mm -hmm. And so I've been now realized that the city has never done it in the past. Well, that's not according to the records I looked at. Okay, so, you mm -hmm. know, the records that I was sent when I asked for a thorough accounting, the records that I was sent had no staff salaries coming out of that money. And so I would like to know exactly who was paid and how much, and the difference between the amount that we're getting through the license contract. Please don't, ex don't confuse it with the franchising fee, because the franchising fee is a different animal, so we're talking about two different pots of money, and the uses of them are separate, so I'd love that. And then nowhere in the MOU contract or in the license agreement does it state that the mayor's office or anybody but BCCT, who what I call for, what I refer to as BCA, Brockton Cable Access, can utilize these funds. So I know that in the contract, 75% in the MOU is supposed to be going to um, BCCT, which I'm referring to as BCA. Correct. And from what I'm understanding, that isn't happening. But, if, but I, I, w I will wait until the next yeah. time we meet to get that information. If you could get it a to us a little bit ahead of time so we can digest it and be educated when we come in, that would be great. And then um, I think that no matter what, we should start looking at changing this revolving fund account to reflect the MOU more appropriately. So maybe before you come in again, you could come up with um, some kind of um, change in the revolving fund account that you might suggest that would more accurately reflect the MOU. Um, and well, then... And I don't, Council, I don't know that a change is necessary, but we'll, we'll come in prepared to review that with you thoroughly at the next FinCon meeting. Um, in, in fact, uh, I've only been mayor for five or six weeks. We've already done quite a bit of work sure. in that area in terms of meeting with BCA and going over what the operating budget will be for the upcoming year and developing a list of capital needs that they have and how we're going to fund it. So I think you'll find that uh, the work that's already be been done is, I think we're going to find out we're, we're pretty close to being on the same page. And then could you just explain um, why you think that you can pay for your staff salary out of BCCT money now that you've read the MOU where it says nowhere that you can do that? Yeah, it, it, it allows, I think, discretion on the other 25% so long as it's related. We actually had the law department review some <coughs> state rulings that go back a number of years that kind of lay out some parameters and uh, I feel very confident uh, that we're well within the parameters, but we're certainly willing to explore all of that with you. Could you have the um, city solicitor prior to the next meeting forward us the citations for those decisions so we can look at them ourselves yeah, I, and get I, a better I understanding? Yeah, I can't speak for the solicitor, but I'll let the solicitor give you his opinion. Yeah, if you could just, if, if there have been decisions that are made, if you just let us know what decisions they are, we can read them. And I'm not an attorney, but I can still read words and interpret words and see what, see what they say. And then, um, just so you know, my reading of the MOU, the 25% in that account was to be used for capital expenditures based on the, um, the, the committee's request of the mayor, and so capital expenditure to me doesn't equal employee salary. I, I understand the yeah. difference between the two, Councillor. Yeah. So the thing is, I kind of want to get an understanding of where you're coming from so I can look into it on my own before the next meeting and not just go in blind and wait to see what you're going to say and then we'll have to postpone it again while we think about it and then come back. So. I spoke with some folks in City Hall that think that the reason that you believe that we can utilize money out of the revolving fund to pay for staff salary is because Mass General Law allows a municipality to utilize revolving fund money to pay for staff salaries as long as they also pay for benefits. Is that the crux of your argument? I think there's more to it than that, Councillor, but I'll be happy to provide all the information you requested. Can you provide it now? What do you think, the, what is the more to it? I, I'm not going to answer without the solicitor being here. I relied on okay, the solicitor's... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize... I, I thought the motion fair. on the floor was to postpone this until the solicitor could be here. Well, that's the motion on the floor, but when I have... Um, it was on, on the, the motion, motion. Council, so I, I allow it. I'll yeah. allow it. But um, uh, 
I, I I'm understand. Sorry. I'm not I, cutting I, you off. Are you, are you, do you have any more? All I, I'm going to rescind the floor, to, and thank you very much okay. for your time. But can I just ask, on the motion, just, yes. just as a point of information, on the motion means I can ask questions. You can within the scope and realm of the resolve of the and, order. And this has been within the scope I, and realm. That's my judgment as well, Councilor. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Mayor, if, if you could, um, going forward, um, I know it's a lengthy contract. I think it would be best if, if the, your office could deliver one to the clerk's office so oh. that there'll be one in the clerk's office if we need it as a resource. And going forward, I'm going to ask respectfully, if there are any documents like that, that the mayor give it to the clerk's office instead of 11 of them if it's that lengthy. I think that's the right thing, and yeah. I ran it by our clerk. Mr. President, we'll yes, be sir. happy to comply with that tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I, do, uh, I do know there's a motion on the floor. I do know that Mr. Lindy and Mr. Miller are here as well. Um, if nobody objects, I don't know if, if, Ms., if you wanted to come up, Mr. Lindy, because I know you have indicated to me that there could be a timing issue if this was continued going forward, right? Come forward, please. Your schedule relative to the next FinCom? Just trying to, I'm, I'm glad this issue has come to light. It's been talked about for a while, and I'm glad it's here before the council so we can resolve it once and for all. Um, just want to make sure um, I happen to serve on the library board that I'm not in two places at right. once on the 17th. They're actually having a meeting on the high holiday, as you put it. Um, and I can certainly be here because this is my job. But maybe I it's, take not, the maybe it's a St. Patrick's Day party and they say it's a meeting. You never know. Uh, <laughs> could be, could be. <laughs> but I, I, I do have a lot of information on this issue, and uh, I think Councilor Studensky indicated that at the last FinCon meeting. I've talked to different councilors that have asked me questions about this, and you know, having been there for 19 and a half years, I have any, I have details up to a point in terms of what monies that. I have information that we received, okay? The, the, the counselor asking questions about what was received, what was spent, you know, I have every penny accounted for, and uh, I just want to, you know, make people aware of that, because yeah, we be don't know resource. what we're getting 75% up. The city of Brockton gets that money taken into it. I've had a few letters cross my desk, but at one point, the letters stopped coming with copies to me, and I never could track down those amounts. If it was uh, hypothetically later in the evening, would that work for you? I'll do whatever works okay. for the council. It'll be, I just, it'll be at the mercy I'll be the available. Council. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lindy. Thank you. There is a motion on the floor to continue to the next FinCom meeting. It's properly second. All in favor of continuance? All opposed? That matter is continued. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, um, number 12, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. Way back. <laughs> Got that nap. Oh, six and seven. Oh, we almost forgot those. <laughs> Number six, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of funds up to a million in excess of amounts already appropriated for the DPW highway snow removal for the purpose of fiscal year 2014 snow removal in accordance with the Chapter 44, Section 31D of the Massachusetts General Laws. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conner, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Thorson, Commissioner DPW. So, Thorson, good evening tonight. Good evening. How could you forget this one? It's such a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> we need a million after tonight. <laughs> could be. Um, before the meeting was uh, started, I handed out a sheet to everybody that shows the 18 snow events that we've had so far this year. Um, you can see we've had almost 60 inches of snow in the city of Brockton so far, and we've spent $3,024,000. Uh, down in the bottom left-hand side is the beginning budget uh, balance that we had, and you can see deficit spent. We're already $666,000 in the hole. So the monies that we are asking for this evening. Uh, we'll pick up obviously that deficit and uh, uh, obviously the authorization is to expend up to the million dollars. It doesn't give me a million dollars extra to spend, but it is allows me to spend up to a million dollars. So that's um, where we are tonight. Uh, this obviously uh, does not include today's activities. Um, we did not plow today, but we did do an awful lot of salting, and um, so we have had uh, crews out most of the day. So if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, actually, my question is probably for Mr. Condon.
I assume I know, but where are we taking this from? It's deficit spending. So we're only allow we're only okay at this point. We're not looking at appropriating the money. You just no, it's just deficit spending, and at the end of the fiscal year or in next year's budget, we'll have to find a way to pay for it. Okay, so we're not looking to take this out of the uh, stabilization not, not, fund. Not right? yet, because I don't know what the final amount will be. All you're allowing right now is deficit spending. I mean, here we are. I think we're probably with this storm, probably pretty close to having expended the whole million. The whole amount, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we're already deficit 666, which we're allowed to deficit spend, but. We're already minus 666. But with the million, I think you'll be back into a positive balance, and we'll have to come back probably at the very next council meeting. Okay, but we're not actually in a positive balance dollar-wise. Right. And so you, I guess what I'm asking is, so you don't think we'll do this till the 2015? What are we in now, the 14 fiscal budget? In 14. You're not looking, you don't think we'll move? Well, there's no place to pay for it out of the 14 monies. If we pay for it during fiscal 14, we'll have to come out of the stabilization fund. And what if do we, we pay have for it in fiscal 15, it'll be paid for in the fiscal 15 budget. What's your ballpark on where we are in stabilization right now? About $6 million. About $6 million. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you Council. Uh, Council Dubois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Thorson, can I just ask you, um, how are we doing with salt? I see on the television, nobody has salt. The salt is missing. Um, actually, uh, one of the smarter things we've done um, is we have three salt sheds in the city of Brockton. One, one at uh, uh, Oak Hill Way, one up on, uh, in your, your up at um, Dorenzo's lot yeah. and one on the fairgrounds. The one on the fairgrounds is a 5,000 ton um, salt shed which we lease from uh, the fairgrounds uh, on a yearly basis and we also lease a salt shed from uh, Dorenzo for about six months out of the year. And uh, right now, knock on wood, um, we're in pretty decent shape. Um, another couple of big storms will be out just like everybody else is, but uh, we've We've been ordering salt on a pretty much on a daily basis, and they just they're just not they're just not coming in. They're not it's not here. It's sitting on ships. It's, nobody has it. They're so unloaded. They're unloading. That you had the foresight to order. Yeah. Time. What so we do job. is um, what we do is uh, at the end of the snow season every year is we fill those. Well, we fill up the two sheds. Uh, we give one back to Dorenzo. He uses it for equipment storage. Um, during the summer months, but the the one at the fairgrounds and the one down at Oak Hill Way is is filled at the end of the season, and so we're we start the season with a, a real good supply of salt. So um, right now we've we've we're running low, but we're we're better off than most people around us. So I think I'm going to be channeling our esteemed former colleague, Councillor Brophy, because I think I remember him asking this all the time. He said that years ago we used to have lower expectations um, for our plowing and therefore the costs were less in difficult times. At what point um, can you say that the city has high expectations for its plowing? Is there any way we could cut back and possibly save some funds? Or is it, a, is it like a public safety issue and really is impossible? Well, number one, it's a public safety issue. Number two, the people now are um, accustomed and used to what we call black roads. And uh, to go back words from there would be uh, inconvenient and potentially a hardship on the people. Um, we do a very, very good job. Um, you do? So if compared to the surrounding towns around us, we do, we do what I consider the best job around here. And um, is it expensive? Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. It's a very expensive service that we provide. Um, however, uh, as I said, we started this probably eight, nine, ten years ago now. So it's pretty much ingrained in everybody's uh, consciousness that this is the way we do it in the city of Brockton. Um, uh, we look at it every year. There's always, we're always trying to find out better ways to do it. Unfortunately, the cost of man and equipment, um, we, we, we in the city, our staff is, is, is very um, short staffed, to, to put it in other words, so we have to bring in an awful lot of outside contractors. Which De Lorenzo are, which does a great job well, on, Dorenzo's on my great. side I mean, of town. Every, I think they're great. Uh, yeah, um, Dorenzo has been um, 
uh, a lifesaver on the north side yeah, of town. They're great. I'm he so has, glad that they live on our side of town. <laughs> yeah. I really am. I know. They, they do a great, great job. But, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so, but they've been, uh, they've been good. I mean, all our contractors actually do a pretty sure. good job. But they're expensive. Their equipment is expensive. Their manpower is expensive. Um, and I can only run my guys, uh, our staff, so many hours and so many uh, so many days in a row before they burn out. And it's just, uh, like I said, we, we went out today salting and uh, we had to borrow three guys from, uh, from water and sewer uh, for the highway because there wasn't enough guys down there to do the job. So we, and then we had to bring in a few private contractors also. So we're, we're doing the best we can with what we've got and uh, that it's just, it is, it's, it's an expensive, it's an expensive uh, pastime in the winter, unfortunately. Um, I think it's a great service because I know um, when I'm staying home and working from home, my husband always goes to work no matter what. No matter what, he's going to work. It's so crazy. And that's the snow plowing is what allows him to do it. So we live in a blue-collar city, and a lot of people can't clock, you know, clock out of work or work from home. They have to be there, so it is a very good service Absolutely, that you absolutely. Plus, uh, you know, we're, our number one thing is public safety. I mean, we've got to have these roads open. I mean, they've got to be open for emergencies. We've got, what, three hospitals in the city of Brockton, and those, uh, they don't close down, so they have to be open for ambulances and any other emergency vehicles. We have to have um, all the streets open. Thank to you. a certain degree. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thornton, good evening. Good evening. And uh, let me just give you a uh, kudos on uh, the snow removal and the snow plowing that you guys, your guys have done this year. A couple of things. Um, the snow holes are really popping up. Here. They, they're not just here, it they're is. everywhere. Oh, they're here. I was in High Park today and I almost lost my truck. But the other thing is uh, the, the snow plows for the sidewalk. I, I know there's uh, ongoing uh, talks about school department helping out. I hope that can be a fruition that to move forward. That, uh, that discussion is still taking yeah, place. No, I understand. We, we, we won't bring that up, but uh, they, uh, that's very, very important to, to yeah, clear out the... It, I, I was going to have it, I was going to do sidewalks today, but we made an evaluation yesterday that it was more important to do sidewalks yesterday and do potholes today. So that's, yeah. and unfortunately we got this weather, so we probably didn't get many of those done. Question, when do the plows get called out? Four inches of snow? Uh, we, we, start, uh, we start talking about it at two inches. When it gets to two and a half, three inches, we, we make a decision that we're going to go at about three and a half, four inches. Uh, we call them in. We'll start calling about three inches, and then... Um, we figure, depending on what kind of storm it is, well, they'll come in. It'll take an hour to mobilize, an hour, hour and a half to mobilize. So by that time, there's usually three and a half, four inches on the ground. So that's okay. when we start to go. What, the problem is if you wait too much longer, you lose it. Uh, we do pre-treat, obviously. We start pre-treating early. But once the pre-treat is over, if we wait too long and the, and the roads get packed down, then you lose the road and you can't, you're not going to get it cleared off until it melts. So you have to, you have to make a call. It's, it's, it's a tricky call to make, but it's usually around three to four inches when we start calling them in. When you pre-treat the roads, is that strictly salt or is that a new product? No, it's salt and uh, we use uh, liquid magic. We could call it liquid magic, I think, what we're still using. But that's, it's a liquid and a, and a, and a salt. And um, you try to get the brine made up. You know, you try to make a brine on the road so it, it will melt the snow when it hits it. Okay, well, we're almost through February. We've got the month of March. Uh, knock on once wood. We get, one, once we get past old St. Paddy's Day, we'll be okay. As they yeah. Say. yeah. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's you, then there. Then there was the famous April Fool storm. Don't so. don't jinx us. I don't hate Don't jinx snow. it. Knock thank on you, wood. Chairman. Yeah. Council Ianeri, followed by Council Rodriguez. Council Ianeri. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, uh, Mr. Commissioner. How are you? I'm great. And I, and I just want to send out uh, my kudos as well to, uh, to you, your staff, and uh, naturally the men, um, and even the women that you have working within your office staff too. But I mean, everybody that's been doing an omen's job during this past winter, because it's been a different winter than what we've had over the last uh, several years, no doubt. So uh, appreciate that. And I have to say that um, with all the storms, I might count maybe one or two or three calls that might come into my house and uh, I think people realize that you know m Mother Nature is uh, singing a different song and 
as my mother used to say, that's one mother you just can't fool around with because it, it happens that way. But uh, I do want to say uh, thank you uh, uh, to you. And um, in regards to what Mr. Conner was even mentioning, um, in regards to the uh, spending, I don't like to see us deficit spend, and I understand what my colleague from Ward 1 was uh, probably trying to uh, come back to and, and maybe use some of the stabilization money, but uh, I, I would rather, if we have to deficit spend right now, I'd rather go that route and, and not even have to um, use stabilization money because I think um, uh, we'll find a way to erase it when, when the time comes, but uh, I think that's the, the safe bet. So at this point, I'm going to make a motion for favorable recommendation. Uh, again, <coughs> on the motion, uh, Council, we did have a few uh, of your colleagues that had a few okay. questions, if you don't mind. Nope. I know Councilor Rodriguez, Councilor Stewart, Councilor Bond, so if we could go on that order. order. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, good, good evening. How are you? I'm fine. And you? Uh, pretty good. Um, speaking of um, public safety, um, I know that there's uh, an ordinance in the books, and I remember when I was in the mayor's office that at least on the uh, television screen on the message board, I remember typing it several times, informing the um, uh, homeowners and businesses in the community in terms of keeping their sidewalks clean of ice and snow. But I was driving around in the, uh, not too far away from the downtown section of the city, uh, actually not too far away from this building itself, uh, more concretely on Commercial Street right around the post office. The, um, the sidewalks around the post office and then the bank across the street from it were in horrible conditions. We had school-aged children walk into the post school in the middle of the road because those sidewalks were being cleaned. Um, what are we doing in terms of enforcing, especially, and I'm not talking about the, you know, the little house in the prairie, you know, prairie with the you know, 10-foot uh, frontage in the sense. I'm talking about long stretches of businesses or areas in the city that are actually, uh, that have long sidewalks, but yet somehow, no matter, no matter where you, I'm, I'm, I'm saying uh, Commercial Street because I happen to be at the post office and kind of looking at that, um, that little path that uh, the children were actually kind of creating in front of the post office. And I took some photographs of it because it was disturbing in the sense because uh, a lady took a tumble in front of me uh, walking through this little path. And I was just wondering, um, I know a lot, has been, a, lot, a lot has been said in terms of um, you know, the issues that we've had in the past in terms of cleaning the, uh, the streets up and the city is always held accountable to the work that needs to be done. But at the same time, I think we also need to hold some of these businesses accountable. What are we doing in terms of enforcement to make sure that these, uh, that these businesses are doing their part to um, keep the city s safe? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense that you're, you're plowing to black mm. you know, to, until you see black in the streets, and yet the sidewalks are a hazard you know, in the sense. And, and I don't honestly believe that the city should be cleaning sidewalks for businesses, to be honest with you, because it, it, you know, every single business has a certain responsibility to do their part to keep the... Uh, well, that's, that's exactly what the ordinance says. Is that each business within the first fire district is responsible to clean their own, uh, their own sidewalks. And that is a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a, a police enforcement issue. It's not a DPW enforcement issue. Um, so we, we'd have to... Uh, I can't remember what the fine is. Uh, there is a fine involved for that, and uh, I don't know if, if the police go around and fine or not, um, but to be honest with you. I don't believe they do. Um, I know they work with us during a storm, and, uh, but that's more for the t moving of traffic and moving of cars, et cetera. Um, so um, as far as the sidewalks go themselves, uh, the ordinance is clear, the ordinance is there. Uh, is there an enforcement issue there? Yeah, there probably is. Uh, have, we inf uh, have we, have the police actively enforced on that? I, not that I know of. So perhaps maybe we can, uh, we can ask the mayor, um, as, the, uh, as the overseer of the police department, is there something that we can actually do in terms of uh, getting the, uh, the police on board, because if you look at it, just look at School Street. You know, when you travel on, you know, from, from where the post office is down to where City Hall is, that sidewalk right beneath the overpass is somewhat unpassable in a sense, you know. Uh, can we, you know, perhaps get the, the police department to uh, at least to focus on that area that basically leads into the school, which is not too far away from here. But I, 
I think it's kind of embarrassing in a sense where, you know, you're five clicks away from the from your town hall, your city hall, and yet the sidewalks around this building itself, not the building itself, but I'm saying the surrounding area, is unpassable in a sense. I think it's kind of, it sends the wrong message to... Um, to those that we are somehow lobbying in and kind of working with to bring into this community when we can't even enforce laws or rules that we have in the books already. I mean, it, there's no way you can tell me that a police officer doesn't drive down. I mean, the police station is located on Commercial Street. If they're heading south uh, towards Crescent Street, there's no way you could kind of miss that whole post office um, or around that bend, you know. Uh, so is there something that we can do in terms of uh, getting at least the... Uh, I mean, I know we, we spend a great deal of time sometimes beating up on residents. And a lot of times I think we, uh, you know, we have a, a responsibility in the sense to uh, making sure that, and I'm not talking about the, the businesses that are taxpaying businesses. I'm talking about government types of businesses that should be doing their part to help uh, the city out. So I'm actually, you know, asking to, to see if we can kind of do something about that, Mr. Mayor. Sidewalks are a complicated issue, I've learned, Councillor, but uh, I agree with your sympathies. Um, I think actually the matter that you passed earlier this evening with uh, the potential of um, uh, creating the ability to do municipal liens is actually in that um, in that state law that the city would adopt is actually some specific language about civil fine and uh, enforcement for failing to clear sidewalks. So that may be a possible solution. Um, there was also a question from a councillor earlier about uh, where we are on plowing sidewalks and I've spent a good amount of time over the last five weeks uh, trying to improve the system for, for clearing the sidewalks and I think actually in the previous storm we did a real good job. Uh, the, um, in terms of specifically that ordinance, I don't have it memorized word for word, but you're right, it only applies to a portion of the, of kind of the central part of the, of the city. Um, I guess my concern would be that if we do enforcement, we have to do it equally. We can't do selective enforcement. Um, I think the other issue would be how we're deploying our police manpower during a time of emergency. I know that we call in officers on overtime to assist with getting cars off of the streets so that the, the plows can plow and particularly in the inner part of the city that's critical because if we don't get the, the street plowed to the correct width that could prevent public safety equipment from getting through in the time of an emergency. So um, I'm, I'm with you on uh, wanting the sidewalks to be clear and wanting property owners to be responsible. Uh, I think that we can certainly uh, work together to try to figure out the best way to do it. You'll find as you approach that sidewalk discussion, you're going to get a lot of different constituencies weighing in with you. And, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah. uh, I understand what you're saying, and I'm not saying to remove uh, a police officer going to a call to, to do this. Uh, I was at the post office days after the snowstorm. No, I'm not happy. If you're telling me the sidewalk outside the post office was not cleared, I'm not happy with that either. You know, I'm saying that there was a path that you can actually walk through. There's a little pathway that, you know, that the, both the children and the residents that, a vast majority of them that live down on, um, at, the, at the housing complex, you can tell there's a lot of foot traffic in that area because of the path that's been created. What I'm saying is that, you know, and this frustrates the daylights out of me when I hear people saying, well, it's the way the unions want to do it, it's the way the government does it, it's the way Boston wants it done, it's the way Washington wants it done. This is our city. And if we say that you're not cleaning the streets or the sidewalk based on the way you're supposed to, you know, we have, we have methods of dealing with this stuff. So does that mean that a citizen can say, you know what, I choose not to stop at the so stoplights anymore because I don't feel like stopping. You know, there's, lo yeah. there's laws. The reason why we sit here and we, we in enact ordinances, laws in the city, is so that people actually follow the rules and the laws that we impose. If, but if there's, if there's exceptions to laws or ordinances, why are we wasting our time passing them? Yeah, well I, my, I my whole thing is there's a bank across the street from the post office with the sidewalk that's not cleaned, and there's a post office that's a government building that should be um, aware that citizens use that sidewalk that should clean it. Because I cannot go down and ask my neighbors to clean their sidewalk 
when there's 100 feet of sidewalk space in front of a post office that's not cleaned. And, and the fact that we're sitting here saying, well, you know how it is, you know, there's not much we can do about sidewalks. I don't care what the sidewalks are on the west side or on the north side of the city are saying. I'm just saying that within 100 yards of this building, there's a sidewalk that's basically unpassable. You yeah, know? I, and we I ought to do something about it because I, I, I had to stop and check the lady out because she took a, a, a nice little tumble, an, an older lady that was actually walking uh, as I was driving by. And the fact that we have that issue two clicks away from this building is, is somewhat embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm just saying that, you know, listen, I'm not being, you know, we, we got to be realistic and understand that, you know what, if there's a snowstorm, we're not saying that, you know, take the one or two police officers that we have patrolling the streets to go out after sidewalks and, and making sure people are shoveling their sidewalks. I'm talking about days after a snowfall, days after, when it becomes icy and dangerous. To me, there's no difference between that and somebody complaining about a street not being plowed. You know, and if they're not going to do it, you know, I'm sure that if we have to... Listen, the post office doesn't own this country, doesn't own this city as far as I'm concerned. There's people that they answer to. And I'm sure that if the city basically says, you, you must clean the sidewalk, not because you should or you could, you must. There's an ordinance in the city that says you have to keep it clean. So I don't know why we have to sit here and negotiate with people to clean sidewalks when we have a law in the books that says you got to do it. Point of information? Council yeah, I, I, it, it, yeah, absolutely. I know this was discussed at length by the council last year. We yeah. had, yeah, we did talk about it. I don't think, I think that we have to, have to shovel the sidewalks. I don't think it's all businesses up the wrong. I mean, Tony might be able to help us out. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's just that fire district. I don't think all businesses in the city have to clear. I could be wrong. Does anybody get an idea on that? I mean, we could change the ordinance. Because it's the central fire district. Right. right. Okay. And that doesn't exactly. include the first all fire district. So we could change the ordinance. So we're, so we're in relations to commercial street. Where is that in terms of the fire district? It's, it's in it. Small area. <laughs> it's not. Council, it's, it's, it's through legislative council. It's this side of Montello Street. This side of Montello Street. Yes. But we so can change that ordinance. Change ordinance. I, I think we need to do that because uh, it makes absolutely no sense where, you know, on this side of Montella Street, people, get, people are, you know, you know, their feet are held to the fire, and then on that, that side of Montella Street, they can do whatever they want to do. That makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. So, Council, on a personal note, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my elderly father fell at the post office on ice and was seriously injured, dislocated his shoulder, had to have surgery, was hospitalized. Uh, for a number of days. So I'm very sensitive to the issue and uh, more than willing to do whatever efforts the city can to, to hold the post office and any other property owners responsible for, for clearing their walks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank Councilor. You, Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I have uh, two questions, one for Mr. Thorson, but the mayor may want to stay there because I, uh, I know that there are conversations about uh, putting GPS on the different equipment, the plowing equipment, and Mr. Right. Thorson, I know that if he could come up. Sure, I'm, I'll give you the background. I've, I've asked the commissioner to uh, do research for me and, and prepare a report for me with, uh, with uh, prices as to uh, uh, vendors and costs of putting permanently installed GPS equipment into all snow removal equipment, both uh, city-owned and independent contractors. I've also spoken to the law office in terms of next year's snow season. Uh, the, the contracts with the outside contractors are done on an annual basis, uh, but before we send out the RFPs and the contracts for next year, that the language in those contracts be amended to require a permanently installed uh, GPS device. I, I feel we, we pay anywhere from 100 and something to $200 an hour for a piece of equipment and an operator. I agree that uh, you know they've been they've been doing a good job, but I think with the millions of dollars we're spending, uh, we certainly have a right to know you know where that equipment is and, and what it's doing while we're paying for it. Uh, and I, so Mr. Thoris, and I know that a, a couple, and I ag agree with that assessment at least in principle. And I know I had asked that question a couple years ago about putting GPS systems in the equipment, and I believe Mr. Young indicated that there were s studies and information that show that that was not effective. So have you guys learned something differently since my first questioning this issue? <laughs> I don't know. What was your first question? Um, I don't recall the conversation. 
So I, you know, in this forum, Mr. Young, when I asked the question about having GPS placed on the equipment, the response was that there were, that, that DPW had learned or that there were studies that indicated that having GPS was not effective. I, I don't recall that, but um, I know the state has, is doing away or has done away with their GPS to a certain degree. Do you know why? Do I know why? They found that it, they did, they did cost effective wise, I don't think they felt it was what they wanted. So I don't know if they've done away with it entirely. I know they've done away with it in sections. I don't know if the entire uh, state fleets have done away with it or not, but I know they've done away with it in, in, sec in areas. Um, we, we have looked at it. We tried a test program about six years ago. Um, unfortunately, it was implemented really too late to be really effective to give us a good readout of what it is. Um, uh, I, I myself have been in, am in favor of it because I think it's not just a necessarily a snow issue. It's a entire city vehicle issue that I would rather keep track of. So I, I, I'm an advocate of GPS. I've been an advocate of GPS. So I, I think that so you know, my your question so is, is do we uh, do we want to try and do it? And I say, yeah, we do. I don't know what I mean. I, I'm sorry, Councillor. I don't know what studies you're referring to that Mr. Re or I don't know what studies Mr. Young is referring to. So I I can't really answer that question for you. I'm so it's sort of a, 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 as a, a more broad question. then. so as head of DPW, if you're in favor of this type of strategy and the state decides not that the state is sort of removing itself from the strategy, do you not? find it part of your interest to find out why the state is, yep. what the state is doing and then yep. to help and inform your decision. And that's what the mayor just said. He asked me to get him a report on uh, cost, et cetera, and uh, efficiencies and uh, any other issues that have come up. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. But, so, and I just, okay, so and it, wasn't, it hadn't been done before so, and, until the mayor requested it then. Okay. We look at GPS every year. I just said that. I look at GPS every year and I try to get it implemented. It's a funding issue. It's a union issue. There's a lot of issues involved. It's not just say, let's put GPS in vehicles. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're expensive. Getting a little bit off point here. Yeah, it's, it's an expensive, it's, it's it's an expensive undertaking is all I'm saying. By all means, because if you want to file a resolve, we could do that. But the issue before us isn't about GPS. Well, it's about funding for snow removal. Snow which removal, not tracking of vehicles within the city limits. The question is around, okay, so I'll, I may have to do that. The um, other question then is made from Mr. Condon um, concerning snow removal costs. Um, so we're looking at, I'm, I'm curious about the trends in the spending in this particular line item, which I don't have by memory what the previous spending um, what the previous costs were. So what does the curve look like in terms of spending in this area? And does climate change, when we had, the, we had the students in earlier from Stonehill College sort of indicating in their presentation, but I think we, we often see this reported, that we should expect more acute weather. And so are we projecting that we're going to be spending a lot more money in snow removal in the coming years? And then what does that projection look like? Well, um, the trend has been slightly up, but I don't think it's been significantly up. It's it's a the snow removal costs for Brockton are really really variable from one year to the next because of our location. We can have years where it's mainly uh, rain events, um, and it wasn't many years ago, maybe just a couple, where there was a surplus in this budget. And then you can have other years where the amount spent is double the budget, and that wasn't many years ago either, where we spent over five million dollars. Um, this. Budget also is affected not just by the total amount of snow, but how often we have to deploy our snow removal equipment. This particular year has been bad because there have been a lot of events that had to be responded to, and that's expensive even though the amount of snow in any individual event is not great. We've had a lot of two inch and three inch and one inch events, but he deploys his sanders and, and salt even if he's not pulling out the uh, commercial trucks. So it's hard to say what the actual trend is, but I don't think there's been a huge expense increase on an average basis, but there's a lot of variability. You can have years where you spend over a only a million and a half, up to years where you spent five million. And um, the council has been reluctant to ex uh, increase the snow removal budget 
by any significant amount. In fact, this last year, the recommended amount was cut by a couple hundred thousand right. dollars. Because once you establish a new threshold in order to do deficit spending, you now need to maintain that threshold and funding, as everybody knows, is tight. So I don't think with the uh, climate change we've seen an awful lot yet, but they do say we're going to see more extreme. So I don't know what, I don't know what, the, what it really means to tell you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chambers. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bonds. Uh, yes, just a quick question, actually, for Mr. Thorson. For the, just for my clarification, the housing authorities or the, the housing buildings, BHA, do they do their own plowing or is that done by the city? The what building? I'm sorry. The high, particularly the high rise on the south side, Campello High Rise. I believe they do their own. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the salt shed rental, is that a fixed cost or will it is fixed cost? Okay, so it will it'll be that 170. Well, it will be, um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. We're under a contract with them now for the next, I'm trying to think when, I'm trying to think of when the, the salt shed north, which is up in the, in Dorenzo's property, I think they're on their third year now, um, so they probably have uh, one or two more years of um, um, extension on them, and then I think the one at the at the fairgrounds is still got several years to go. So it it should remain fairly constant for the next um, couple of years anyway. It's going to have to be renegotiated uh, eventually, but okay. right now it's it's it's. So this amount reflects all three of the. The shed. Well, one of them belongs to the city, so one of them's ours. So. Oh, okay. Um, so the two. It's for the two, yeah. One is a year-round rental, and one is like a six-month rental, I think. So okay. the costs are. I can't give you the exact breakdown of each one, but um, that's how it works. Okay. Now, on the bottom of this, it says um, you're already estimating over six hundred and you know sixty-six thousand over, not including a pending storm, right? Wait, what's today? Wait, what's today? That's today. 18th. Oh, okay. So not today. Okay. So this storm here. So this is not added into this, just to be clear. I no. Just to be clear. No, no. We, matter of fact, I was, uh, we just got the, uh, the uh, 15th to the 17th storm in today. So that's why I got it added in. Or otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have had that one either. But we just got the cost and figured on that one. Okay. So um, we're, up to, we're up to date with ex the exception of today. Okay. And I would guess if What I do you had, anticipate that? What's that? What do you anticipate that cost to be? Uh, if I had to guess, I would say it would be somewhere in the b between item number 16 and item number 17, between thirty and $60,000. I was going to say about $50,000. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 50000 is a good guess. Yeah. It's a good, good estimate. Okay. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you, Councilor. Councilor DiNapoli. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thoris, and this is not related to you, but it's going back to what uh, Councillor uh, <coughs> Moses uh, about the post office. I spoke to the postmaster over at the post office, and I told him how deplorable the conditions were in the sidewalk, and uh, they're they're short-handed, and they expect they expect really the city to, to maintain the sidewalks with the new snow plows we have. Everybody has the assumption that. Mr. Thornton's equipment will take care of it. Okay. But, you know, if, if people are watching out there, you know, take care of the snow in front of your property. You know, uh, you have to help the city a little bit. We, you know, we endure, we, we're spending, you know, so far we, what we spent were six, the storm, uh, every, every storm that we have is thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. That's and without it, plowing. That's without plowing. Then when, when you plow, it's four hundred and eighty thousand dollars. You know, and uh, so you know, give give us give us a helping hand. You know, I plowed my own street today, and De Lorenzo, good old Ward Six, came up the street and he salted. it. My street was nice and clear. You know, I hey, listen. I do my part. Everybody else has to chip in. You sure do. Buy a truck no. and plow. I love it. Just, just, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just don't send me the bill, okay? No, Mr. Thorne, <laughs> I'll never send you a bill. I Council can't afford Cruz, it. You had, a, you had a follow up? Yeah, I had one last follow up for Mr. Condon on the appropriation. Jay, at least once in the past, and I assume it's been a few years, the state has done a supplemental 
yes. appropriation and helped out the cities and towns. Any kind of rumor out of DOR about that? Or? Boy, I, I would like to think they'd do it again, which is another reason not to, to take care of the uh, deficit yet, because if they do, then you don't have as big a deficit to go apply for that money. Um, yeah. So we're better off keeping that as a deficit. I, I think so. If otherwise, I would have recommended money out of the stabilization fund. I think you're better off. At some point, you're going to have to spend the money. It's either going to come next year's budget, as I said, or out of the stabilization fund, and probably next year's budget will be out of the stabilization fund. But in the past, when they've granted that relief, they've granted it to the extent that you showed a deficit. So if we fix the problem, we've helped them a little bit, and I don't want to do that yet. But I haven't heard any talk of their doing that. It, it's probably true across the state that every community's budget's in trouble. I mean, it's, the, it's, it's been a tough winter. It has been, and I think it's been not just the amount. Isn't, I mean, we were talking about that with just a few minutes ago, the commissioner and I. First of all, you've had these extreme variations in temperature. Right. So you get a storm winter, it's 28 or 30 degrees, and it's kind of slushy. All of a sudden, two days later, it's down to zero or 10, and it's, it's, it's hard as concrete. It's hard to remove at that point. You've had a lot of uh, episodes, as I said, and some big ones. So it's really been a lot of expense. And, but on the other hand, the governor's budget did nothing uh, for the cities and towns for fiscal 15. Nothing. I mean, there's no increase in there at all. So based on that, I don't have a lot of hope. Maybe there'll be pressure from another source to say... Well, he's leaving, so hopefully the House and the Senate are going to make yeah. a different budget. Uh, but it would be nice if they gave us even fifty to $100,000. I mean, you know, we're... Yeah. Anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Cruz. Mr. Cruz, I want to thank you for this spreadsheet. Uh, this, is, this is actually good. I've been on the Council nine years. I've never seen anything like this relative to a, a real-time update. Um, I'd ask... Uh, on behalf of everybody here, if we could continue to get this on a fairly regular basis oh, sure. throughout yeah, the winter. We, we I think we it's do helpful, that. right, Councilors? Yes. Thank you. Okay. We do that uh, after every storm. We started, that'd be that. we started that a couple years ago. Okay. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Motion to recommend we have, favor. We have a motion. Uh, recommend favor. It's properly second. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation of the full City Council. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we are number seven, please. Order that the DPW is authorized to issue a one single family home sewer connection once all necessary city permits are approved to the property owned by Lars and Margaret Johnson and located at the corner of North Cary Street and Thayer Ave, parcel ID 161 116, plot number 107, Cary, book page 05392 00422, invited Michael Thorson, Commissioner of DPW, Lars and Margaret Johnson, property owner. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Council Dubois. Um, this is a sewer connection in Ward 6. Um, some of my fellow councillors who are new may not know and some people at home may not know, so I'll explain it now. Ward 6 has a sewer moratorium based on backflow and septic issues with the interceptors that of Ward 6. It started, oh, Sunny Goss had it, got removed, got put back on Madonna Daly. Um, and this is one area um, over on North Cary Street where that interceptor down at North Cary um, by the gas station has been replaced and I spoke with Mr. Thorson he says that issuing this sewer connection will not affect negatively the sewer system at all so at this time I ask unless Mr. Thorson has something no, to say no, I ask uh, for a favorable recommendation Second. 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 Uh, on, on the motion uh, for the new councilors uh, Council Dubois uh, is 100% accurate but, but bear in mind Ward 6 is the only ward in the city of Brockton that does have a storm moratorium there was one in Ward 5 that was lifted with Council Denapoli um, Motion was made properly second for, uh, to favorable recommendation of the full city council. All in favor? All opposed? That motion carries. It's a favorable recommendation to the full city council. Madam Clerk, I believe we're getting to the end. Number 12 on the agenda, please. <laughs> Resolved that the Mayor Carpenter be invited to the next Finance Committee meeting to enumerate the number of in staff positions that are currently in need of reappointment and discuss this plan for reappointing each staff position that is currently overdue for reappointment, including but not limited to the positions of building commissions, DPW commissioner, and treasurer collector. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter. Mr. Chairman. Council Dubois, I know this is your resolve. Thank you so much. Um, I filed this just to find out what the plan is. Um, I know that, as far as I understand, um, we have a DPW commissioner, and we have a treasurer collector, and we have a building commissioner that uh, appointments expired mm, probably close to a year ago now. So some in February, some in March, and of course, you know, you're only a couple months on the job, so this is no reflection on you, but I'm just wondering, because I had a problem with the previous mayor letting these positions um, go unappointed and letting these people be in a permanent place of stasis and really no, like, leader 
at the head of that department um, that felt comfortable and confident in their decisions and independent and professional. So I'm just wondering, what is your plan for these three positions? Sure. So, uh, Councillor, I guess I'm, I'm going to be a little generic in my comments because I have to be careful not to cross the line to um, publicly comment on individual employees' current status, job performance, etc. Um, but uh, obviously you've inquired about three positions. As you mentioned, uh, they're all holdover positions that I inherited that were in that status for some time before I got here. Uh, I think that one of those three positions has been resolved. One of those individuals has announced their retirement. So, uh, when is that? When is the who, which one? The DPW commissioner has announced his retirement. And when will he be retiring? On or about August 1st. August 1st. And will you have someone to replace him on August 1st? Or yes. What, you will. Because I think part of the advantage of uh, of uh, the commissioner announcing his retirement in advance uh, gives us the opportunity to. Um, to do some evaluation of the department, its management structure and operations, and, and uh, really have a chance to look at uh, all those branches of that department. And I think it also affords us now an opportunity to conduct a, uh, a thorough uh, job search um, without having to go through an interim. So, you know, my intention is to complete all of that before Mr. Thorison completes his service with the city and uh, be prepared to be appointing uh, his re a permanent replacement for him without having to use an interim. So, um, so that, and that's already, that's already in motion. So that is going on on one hand in the DPW, and then you're utilizing this transfer of um, department head to look at a thorough review of reorganiza reorganizing the whole department. Is that, did I understand I, that? I think, it's, I think the timing is good uh, to bring in some outside expertise and, and give us some, um, some comparison with best practices in other municipalities like Brockton around the Commonwealth and take a look at... Uh, organizational structure and changes we might consider making uh, while we're um, before we hire a new permanent commissioner. I think that the timing is right for that and that'll be part of the process. And uh, we'll also uh, work on um, job description and job search and conducting a thorough um, outside search. I'd like to conduct a wide ranging huh. search for the best possible candidate for that position. And I think that we have a timeline that we can get all of that done before Mr. Thorison completes his service. So what role do you think the city council or private citizens are going to play in this major revamping of the DPW? Well, I, I didn't say there was a major revamping. What I said was we're going to take an outside look in at our organization and structure and operations okay. in terms of looking at um, best practices and, and models in other cities of similar size and, and um, characteristics of Brockton. So uh, just just an opinion, um, and maybe I would have to file a resolve in order to or an order to make it more um, inclusive. I in my I hope that you would make this transparent, because any type of change of any major um, purpose like this beyond the department head, which you have every right in the world to choose right. who you want, um, really should be um, transparent and open to daylight. So um, that's just my opinion, but we'll get to that as the as we move down the road. What what about um, the treasure collector? So in terms he's been without a uh, reappointment, I think, since March. So that's going on I don't a think year. So. Off the top of my head, I believe the other two department heads were just since October. I believe that DPW no. is back to March. Well, it's irrelevant. I became no, mayor five so weeks you know, ago. It's, it's in the city ordinances. I believe it's February for the treasure collector. And it might, it's either February or March for one of them and February for the other. But that's semantics. Um, because um, Mayor Balzotti was pushed on why aren't you report, uh, reappointing these people and it was many months before that, um, that requirement that you can't reappoint people within so many days of the election. It was probably six months out and she made the decision that she was just going to let them be holdovers until the next election so that the incoming mayor or herself could reappoint in January. So that's how I remember it, but that's all semantics. Yeah. What do you think your plan is? I think the, uh, and I agree with, I think, you know, asking me to recap what happened last yeah, year is not great. productive and not fair to anyone involved. Uh, I can tell you what my plans are and what we've done so far. 
Uh, I uh, have asked all of the department heads to provide me with year-end transition reports. I requested some specific information in terms of what the departments did last year, their job functions, their personnel uh, accomplishments last year. I asked them also to provide me with uh, goals for this upcoming year. And those reports were due to me uh, just last Friday. I've got them all in. I'm taking the time to review them this week. And then beginning next week, I will, over the course of about three weeks, be holding one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with all of the department heads, reviewing their reports, and also discussing uh, early versions of their requested budgets for the upcoming year. The reason I outline that to you, I think in fairness to the two department heads you're talking about, that they deserve the opportunity to go through that same process with me and sit down and review with me what they've done with their department last year, what their plans are for this year, what their goals are, and for me to have an opportunity to uh, really get a good feel. So um, my intention, Counselor, is to make decisions uh, on both of those departments as soon as possible. Uh, but I think that in, in fairness to them and so that I can make the best possible decisions and obviously those appointments are subject to council approval so that I can make the best possible recommendations to the council, I do need to have an opportunity to, to spend some time with them and that's going on right now. Sure. So you expect probably to be making a decision like um, before July? I would expect to be making decisions in the next 30 to 45 oh, days. Wow. Okay, great. And then what other positions? I think that there is, I think it's important. I agree with you that I think it's important both for the city, uh, for those individuals, and for the people who work in those departments to uh, have clear leadership. And that's what we're working towards. Okay. Um, how many other positions are um, holdovers? Is there, how do I, how do I Those are the only department head positions uh, that I'm aware of that uh, are holdovers. Okay, on boards and commissions, that's a whole nother story, and, and we're addressing those also. I sent I'm up more or less wondering about um, positions heads. that get a salary from the okay. city. So each staff position that's a mayor appointment. I don't know how many there are beyond department heads. I know uh, that there are some, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure. Off the top of my head, I believe it's the mayor's office and the law office are the only two that are at the discretion of the mayor. Okay. Um, I'm not anticipating any changes in the law department. I've stated that previously to the council. And the only three department heads that I'm aware of are the three that you asked me about. And uh, there's a plan in place for one, and we're working on the plans for the other two. And I expect to be getting back to you on that sooner rather than later. All righty. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, and, Council, anytime you have a question on something like that, feel free to pick up the phone and call me. I will. I just have another question, actually, now that you just reminded me. Is there any way, um, how would we go about, when you're done reviewing them, getting copies of the year-end transition reports so we can kind of look and see, because they come before us for raises and things like that. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see where they've been and where they plan to go. Off the top of my head, I don't have an objection to it. So. Sure, so I'll touch base with you next week, and then whenever you're done reviewing I think, reviewing I think them. probably the correct timeline would be after I've made decisions and made recommendations to you on those two, right. two uh, positions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions, Council? Um, Council Stewart. I think, actually, Mr. Mayor, the, I forget the name of the consulting firm that DPW uses for uh, engineering advice, but there was a report written that provide some recommendations for how to better structure DPW, which I read a couple years ago. I just want to make certain you're aware well, of yeah, it. Well, yeah, I know that there's one that I just read recently that the council paid for on water and sewer in 2011 that you spent a lot of money for, and um, I have that, and I've read that. Okay. I think there may be one before that. Okay. Just so, just so you're aware of it and you yeah. can ask for it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mr. Thank you, Council. It's a 10 a motion. Motion to recommend Second. favorably. Second. Motion's been made properly. Second, a favorable recommendation of the full city council. All in favor? All opposed? That motion carries. We are uh, finally towards the end of the evening. Number 13, please. <laughs> Resolve that the mayor, chief financial officer, and personnel director be invited to appear before a committee for this council to discuss the impact of the residency law and to review the recommendation of the DOR to appeal the residency ordinance. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Maureen Cruz, Personnel Director. Council Stewart. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, um, I uh, filed this resolve, um, and just a bit of history or sort of background of why I, I like to discuss this. I you know, came into office a big proponent of residency for some of the stated reasons um, that we often hear, one being that if you work in the city 
and you're required to work in the city, you end up spending your money in the city, and it's a good investment for Brockton. Uh, we also hear that there's a belief that city workers would be more dedicated to the position if, they're, if they live and work in the city. Uh, that sh if you're a police officer and you live and work in the city, that um, you'd be a better crime fighter. If you're a firefighter, you're more likely to do a better job in your, no, in your profession and et cetera. Um, and um, I, I frankly, outside of the investment argument, haven't found a single study, and I've looked, at, looked into this, where the other attributes of encouraging someone to be a better employee is based on where they live. Uh, in addition, I have increasing concerns that we're not able to bring in uh, the best talent to the city uh, because of the residency law, based on the fact that that some positions are tied directly to our political cycle and that um, you know, professionals who have choices to work almost anywhere um, may be less likely to uproot themselves and their family to move to the city, um, not knowing if in fact that they'd have that position two years later if there's a change in uh, the administration. I'm, so for me, this is a conversation of to um, have a discussion if, in fact, the residency law is living up to its um, ideal state and if, in fact, we should uh, look at it more closely to make certain that it, it is not, in fact, um, putting us uh, in a less advantageous position uh, because of the restrictions. But the, the one part of the law that concerns me the most, and I've expressed this in different ways previously, is that if a law has so many exemptions and so many exceptions, and that we can't enforce it equally, then that law needs to be amended or to include everyone or taken off the books because it's unfair. And I think the mayor just previously said in terms of sidewalk snow removal enforcement that um, you, know, you want to be able to equally apply the law and um, not have it unfairly targeted to some individuals and not others are enforced by it. So, I, I, so I, I, I'm bringing this up as a discussion. I, I'm hoping that we can learn more about the impact of the residency law on our ability to uh, attract talent, um, but also to make certain that it's equally applied to all uh, individuals who are interested in working in the city. So I've asked the personnel director, Ms. Cruz, to kind of give us a lay of the land of where we stand on the impact of the law in the city. But I'd like to start off with a, a couple questions. And firstly, just if uh, you could, Ms. Cruz, uh, talk us through just the genesis of the residency law uh, and its original intent, and if you think we're, we're achieving the original goals of this, of this ordinance. Well, I don't know that I'm the one that should say what the intent was for because I didn't draft the ordinance or the referendum question, so I don't feel that I'm the person who should respond to that. Uh, I, in your, your comments, you spoke about what people said about the residency ordinance, that people, if they work in the city, uh, if they should live in the city, all of those things. I've heard all those things, and I think that's why the question was put on the ballot back in 1991. Um, and it was a ballot question. So um, the people voted it. Uh, right. The ordinance was amended after the vote uh, because for a couple of reasons. One, the initial ordinance referred to promotions that if you were to be promoted, you had to live in the city of Brockton. Uh, we also had to bargain the residency ordinance with unions because you can't, that was a change in working conditions. Because for many employees, they were not um, required to be Brockton residents when they were f initially hired. So to make a change in a working condition, you have to bargain that. So we had to do that with all unions. And that was not done until 1996, um, because each mayor makes their decision as to what their priorities are for bargaining obligations. And in those days, we were looking at uh, trying to get health insurance concessions from the union. So you had to make a determination as to what um, items you wanted to put in front of the unions and how much money you had to basically give and take with the unions to get the, um, the items settled and resolved. 
So in 1996, when we went to the bargaining table, we bargained the item with the unions. And I, I did send all the counselors the information. I have copies again. If, if you uh, need them, I will give them to the clerk that talks about the breakdown. And before we uh, look into these documents, uh, just a, a few more questions to set this up for myself. Um, so if, so the ordinance was, so it was a non-binding referendum, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and um, has there been any type of uh, sort of evaluation or measure of employees who, to determine if the intended impact of the, of the ordinance is actually happening? So have we done surveys of employees who live in the city and surveys of employees who do not to figure out if they're happier with their job, more effective? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how do we determine if this is actually meeting whatever the end goals may be. There's been no survey of that kind. So there's no type of assessment at all around the effectiveness of the ordinance in the city of, of any type at all, correct? I was never given any direction to do any type of survey okay. like that. And I, I'm asking not to to, yep, to make nope. judgment on your performance, just nope. so if I understand what data mm -hmm. exists at all, if there, is, if there, because I think it's important for us to know um, if something's actually working or not, um, and then how do we determine if a rule is in place, if it's serving its purposes or not. And so at the moment, we, it's clear there's no data to determine that at all. And as, as I mentioned, I couldn't find any sort of outside information that was beyond anecdotal about some of those overarching principles to why people support. Uh, the ordinance. Um, just so I can clarify for, clarify for myself as well, so contracts supersede local ordinances? Correct. Okay. Um, so let's go into your document then. So uh, if you can just give us a broad sense, I know you've done a lot of research uh, on this and I appreciate it. Um, so in theory, every single person who works in the city uh, ideally would be under an, an ordinance about residency, re a requirement of residency, correct? Theoretically speaking. Theoretically speaking. Okay. But and due and to the fact that we had to bargain over the uh, residency ordinance, the ordinance was written, everyone hired, first hired after 1992. So anyone hired prior to 1992 did not, does not fall under the residency ordinance. The ordinance, again, initially spoke to the matter of promotions. If, even if you weren't uh, first hired after 1992, but you were going to be promoted, then you would have to be a resident of Brockton. At that point in time, we already had employees who were not residents of Brockton because they weren't required to be. That piece of the ordinance was amended by city council after the, the, the uh, referendum question. That was amended. They took out promotions. I see. And so then we bargained with all these city side unions. I can't speak to the school department. And it was implemented for all new hires after, for most of them, January 1st, 1992. There are a couple unions that you will see that had dates in 1996. And the reason for that was because there were in new hires between the period of 1992 to 1996. It was not a condition of their employment when they were hired. Therefore, the union said they would not agree to the January 1st, 1992 date because employees would have to move to the city of Brockton. So right off the bat, we have an ordinance where a certain number of people are grandfathered in. So you conceivably, you could have uh, two individuals in your city uh, living next door to each other, both working for the city with the exact same jobs. But depending on when they were hired, they fall under, they're treated differently under the law. That's correct. Now, and, and what's the percentage of the individuals who, um, regardless if it was before 1992 or not, or because we know that teachers, for example, are exempt from ordinances because they have a more effective statewide union, and so they, they automatically don't fall under this, this rule. How, what's the percentage of individuals who are exempt for whatever reason uh, under the ordinance and, and those who are not? The, on the city side, there are uh, 685 employees. 544 of them fall under residency. And 362 of those have met the seven-year requirement to be to, um, 
the seven year requirement is after seven years you can move out. So 362 of those employees that fall under the mm -hmm. residency have met that requirement. And of that 362, 82 have moved out of the city of Brockton. Mm -hmm. The others are still residing in the city of Brockton. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers for the school department are, um, are different and I did not compile the data, but the information is here and you are right. Um, school teachers are exempt uh, and I believe, I can't say this to be true, but I believe that uh, paraprofessionals are also exempt from residency by education reform, but that question you'd really have to uh, address to the school department. Um, so that takes the paraprofessionals. Um, there's, according to this, the, uh, they have no residency clause mm -hmm. for the paraprofessionals. So I don't think on the school department it is strictly just teachers. Um, as you can see, for the school department, there is no residency clause for the BEA, paraprofessionals, nurses, lunch aides, MTAs, principals and associate principals, administrators at central, <laughs> bilingual facilitators, teachers at the Huntington, which are actually part of the BEA, and there's no residency requirement for all other non-union and part-time seasonal. So truthfully, you're talking about a small minority of employees in the school department that fall under residency. Um, it's the clerks, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, and the school police. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, looking at those numbers, you're talking about maybe four or 500 school employees, mm -hmm. uh, and your total of school employees is about 2,400 people. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a large disparity in the school department as far as who falls under residency and who does not. And technically, they're city workers. I mean, they, and um, I mean, I, don't work in the city of, of Brockton. I work outside of Brockton. I think I'm a highly qualified, dedicated employee, and I don't have to live in the city where I work to give my best to my position. And I think many individuals will probably find themselves in that same situation. Uh, I think we can look on the, look every morning, look at the trains moving uh, from Brockton into Boston, knowing that those Brockton residents are working in a city where they don't live, but they're likely giving their best to that position, their best professionalism. Um, but the big concern for me, again, is uh, having a law in place that's not equally applied, uh, and which then starts to uh, have me question who's most impacted by it. Uh, and it seems to me, and it, aside from the issue of bringing in the best talent, typically when a law is not applied evenly, what I discover, and based on who's exempt and who isn't, usually you find folks who are likely the least paid with the least political power who are the ones who are forced to follow the rules and then those who are more highly paid with a lot more political power are usually the ones exempt from these kinds of rules uh, in most cases. Uh, and so that concerns me in general. So you have your clerks and your cafeteria workers and all these other folks who are Correct. forced to follow a, a rule that most others are exempt from. Uh, but we know that people tend to focus on the high profile positions like department heads and some, and so I wanted to um, ask questions from your experience about uh, where the city may have lost talent um, because of the fact that some of those high profile positions are tied to the terms of the mayor. Uh, and so if I were offered a position or interested in a position uh, but had to move in, within a year, not knowing if I would have the job the following year, uh, what is that, where does that place the city in terms of bringing in the best talent? Um, I don't have any specific statistics on that, but I do, uh, from my almost 17 years as director of personnel, I can say to you that there have been numerous cases where interview letters have gone out, a selection committee, depending on the position, has, have chosen a group of applicants to be interviewed for positions. And when we send out notifications to be interviewed, we also send them a copy of the residency ordinance and an affidavit that states that they must sign the affidavit as part of the interview process. And it states that if you do not move into the city within one year, you voluntarily terminate your employment with the city of Brockton. There have been cases where people have declined the interview. They haven't stated why, but in many cases they've been a non-resident 
and there have been many cases where they just fail to appear at the interview. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those have been non-residents. Um, I think when they see the ad, they think that maybe the residency requirement isn't real, but it is. And mm -hmm. when they see on paper that they will voluntarily terminate themselves within one year, they sometimes decide that it's not a risk that they're willing to take because, yes, you are correct, especially for certain department head positions where it is a three-year term, you're subject to a three-year term, appointment by <coughs> mayor or a board, council confirmation, you're, you're, you're taking a large risk to uproot your, if you have a family, uproot your family, move them to Brockton, or in today's economy, attempt to sell your house. That, those are some issues that people find very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I believe, yes, there have been cases Question. where we have lost um, applicants due to the residency ordinance. And, and are you aware of any study that uh, if, if the goals of the residency law uh, are as, as what I've stated and what I've heard, better performance, more investment in your community, uh, outside of the dollar investment, but your commitment to the city, have you, because I have not been able to unearth a study that proves that to be true. I'm not aware of, and quite honestly, when I've reached out to my colleagues in, uh, in this, the Commonwealth, a lot of communities don't have residency ordinances. Mm -hmm. So I you know, haven't been able to even get any information through my colleagues based on that because most communities don't have the residency ordinance. And as you, you I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, as you indicated um, when you started discussing this um, in your emails with me that the DOR report recommended repealing the residency ordinance, you asked what data they used. They really didn't use any data. Uh, it's just a recommendation that they had based off um, their experience across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and I actually am, and I often talk about how that we should be very affirmative about making certain that we hire folks in Brockton and that these positions are open to Brockton residents. That's what we all want. I just have concerns about making it mandatory and when we're not able to attract the best talent, we're sort of, we're, we're not taking full advantage of the, of the position and the responsibility of that position to give the best return on investment to taxpayers if we're not able to attract the best talent. Um, can we talk a little bit about the difference between a resident um, a residency requirement versus a residency preference? Well, uh, quite honestly, for um, public safety positions, police and fire, we have a residency preference list that we use through civil service because we do have a residency ordinance. So therefore, um, they move to the top of the list if they are a resident. They have to be a resident one year prior to taking the exam. So we automatically use a residency preference list for entry-level public safety positions. And is there a reason why we wouldn't want to have a similar model for all positions? I mean, it seems to be, to me, be, to be a bit more advantageous because if you are a resident or you're interested in moving here, you get extra points. Um, but if you're incredibly qualified, um, not interested in, in, so it gives someone who wants, who lives in Brockton or has an interest in moving to Brockton some extra points in terms of the interviewing process, uh, but it doesn't require that we hire someone who may not at all fit the bill, who, but who happens to live in the city. Correct. Uh, I, it, it's, it's an opinion. Um, but I also, I also think that most department heads that are currently doing hiring in the city, they, they use a residency preference for all new hires because quite honestly, if they can find a good candidate in Brockton, that's the right thing to do. They also, if they have two, equally can, two equal candidates, one who's a Brockton resident and one who's not a Brockton resident, it's not worth it for them to hire the non-Brockton right. resident because in more than likely in one year, they're going to be back to the drawing board filling that position again because more than likely that pers person is not going to be able to move to Brockton or choose to move to Brockton. So they're going to be back at the drawing board. So I believe that most department heads use residency preference in their selection process. Uh, and then finally, and I'll open up the floor to my, my colleagues, is there any other regulation that you work under or a rule or ordinance in terms of human resources where an ordinance or a law or a rule is applied unequally? I 
can't think of one off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Stork. Councilor Yanieri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good evening, um, Ms. Cruz. Thank you for uh, being here this evening and uh, also discussing with us in regards to this matter. And, and I have to say that um, I took some notes in regards to you giving us uh, the history of the, um, the whole residency law and ordinance and how it became affected here in the city of Brockton. And, and I was probably, I, as I look around, I think I was the only elected official back then because I was on the Brockton School Committee um, when, when the ballot question was voted and was there also when there was an amendments made to it somewhat um, back in 1996 under the units administration because that's when it was amended. Um, I know under the Fowl administration, um, he didn't really he didn't really implement it, and it sat a little bit in limbo. And then all of a sudden, it had to become it had to become you know the the the, the beef of how people were going to be um, hired, and and it was done through that 1996 and through contracts is how it was Correct. how how it was done. Um, let alone the fact that you know an ordinance was uh, also amended somewhat <coughs> in regards to the promotion piece. Um, but <coughs> then again. I guess the way that um, the way that I've always looked at it and, and understood it first is one, the voters voted it. Number two, I'm not going to ever change it unless it goes back to the voter. I don't care how many times it gets written or gets before me as an ordinance or whatever. I'm I'm never going to change it because it's not my job to change it. It's the voters' job to change it because that's how it became a law. And I think, if I'm mistaken. I believe we have exemptions to it, which also gives us the power as a council to make waivers. I think that's happened over the years when we wanted to see other talent. And I don't mean to use him as an example, but our CFO was given a different type of a waiver when he came into the city of Brockton during most difficult times because they wanted to make sure they had the right person to do the financial piece, which in my mind, I think he's done that, and I know there'll be some people that would be, well, they're not all here tonight that are usually here to say that he doesn't do that, but I, I say, yes, he has done that. Um, and we've given some other exemptions as well as, as to different waivers to um, what the residency law, um, you know, has allowed us to, to do with. But um, just in point, I mean, I, I think the, the people that we have here in the city of Brockton are talented people. I really do. I think we, we find the most talented people. We, we, we have some great people that have worked in the city for, for many, many years. Y yes, some, some may be related, you know, might have been their mother or father or grandmother or grandfather that was a part of the system some years ago and, and through the whole residency act they're still here and, and they've done their due diligence and like you've said, there, there is a, there's a limit here when, you know, you reach that seven year plateau. If you want to leave the city of Brockton, you do. That's, that was part of that whole amendment change. But, um, I just don't, I don't know, and, and I don't know where the council is going with this, but in my own mind, in my own way of looking at it is, I, I just think that, uh, you know, if you're going to change the residency law in any such way, bring it back to the voters. Let the voters make a decision. Don't ever leave your constituents out of it. And I think we heard that the other night when we had a joint meeting at West Junior High School from a gentleman that stood up and even, yeah. even asked a question, why is it when everybody goes home at night they leave Brockton? And he's our new population that's here in this city. And he's asking, why are people leaving my city? So um, there's talent here. And there's plenty of good talent. And we have great talent. And, uh, and, and I, I mean that. I mean, I, I want to see people here in the city that live in the city working on my departments, not coming from all, you know, Hull and Mashpee and uh, Yarmouth and all those other places. Brockton's a great city. And I think, uh, I, I think um, we've done well with the talent that we have here. Thank you. And I, I'm not... Barking at you, Maureen. I'm no. just making my point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilor Neary. Councilor any other? Councilor Dubois. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I just have a few comments. It's really not questions about this since we're going to be discussing it. So feel free to stand there or not because I may come up with a question, but I might not. Um, so I've been sitting for a while, so I'll stand. I appreciate it. I really do. Okay, so um, my, first, my first thought and to clear the record is it, it really is a false argument um, to say that the reason that the residency requirement uh, was put in is because local people are going to do better jobs than people outside of the community. It's a false argument. It's a little, you know, disrespectful because it kind of puts people that want a residency requirement in the position of feeling like other people are bad because that's, that's just not true. 
I almost have never had a job in Brockton, and I've always worked outside of the city. But where I work and what I do has nothing to do with the residency requirement. As I understand it, the reason that the residency requirement was passed was partially economic and partially for exactly the results that we got. We got a list of um, no public safety or fire, but we got a list of people that work for the city and are part of the residency requirement and we can't even talk to the school department because that's excluded. So let's not even, you know, bring that into the equation. The city employees that were hired through the residency law and have to live here seven years before they move out, if you look through this list, 90% of the people stayed in the city of Brockton after they were able to leave. So the residency requirement does two things. First off, it allows people to come to the city get a job if they don't know the city, see the city, and find out that they love it just like we do. And then they decide to stay here and have their families here. And we have people that live here that can actually afford to pay their bills and afford to buy groceries and have pride in the city that they are working to keep clean. And their children look at their parents and their fathers and their mothers and say, wow, my dad works for the park department. So my dad worked for the park department. He's a great guy. He really likes the city. It makes me love the city that I live in. So it may be easy for someone that wasn't born in the city to feel differently. But I've lived here my whole life and I've seen the effect on the community when you can actually get a job that you're qualified for, no offense to custodial workers, to park employees, to highway or water people, but <coughs> those aren't exactly extremely high skilled. You don't need a college degree to do those things. So the fact that we're gonna open that pool up and make it more difficult for people that live here and have to support their children to go up against people with, from outside of town, is, it just seems totally inappropriate to me. So not only do I support the residency requirement and I will totally vote against any repeal of it, the only way I would even consider not voting against it is if we put it back on the ballot. So it is a little offensive to me um, and recently we we saw Ray Flynn he came here to swear in for the swearing in ceremony of the commissioner which was great because who doesn't like him and just three days ago Ray Flynn was on NPR and he was talking about Boston's residency requirement and in Boston he's he can't all the kids can't find work and he was adamant that the city of Boston needs to keep its residency requirement because they need a step up because these kids need to be able to get a job and why not give them a little help and then while this was going on I did a Google search residency laws and the one just very first require, very first analysis of residency laws some of the some of the reasons that they're good is it gives local control you, people spend tax dollars. Residents spend their, spend their tax dollars on residents. And then those people that get salaries are able to go out and shop in the communities where they live and get their lunch and all these other things. It stems the middle class flight and provides economic stability to certain urban neighborhoods. This is what the residency re requirement does. Provide, it provides employment for residents. It provides racial and ethnic balance in public employment jobs in communities that have high racial, um, racial minorities living in them. The benefits of certain workers living close to prox oh, it benefits certain workers because they get to live close to where they work. I drive 45 minutes away and it's a pain in the neck. So I really value the fact that someone that has three or four kids can get home in time and they live in my city to be able to go home and be a parent. And that's something we should be proud of. Um, longer commute time impacts employees, congestion in transportation infrastructure. And um, that's what this one survey says. So I understand where you're coming from and I understand the the the... <coughs> the flyers we got here, but when you look at what you put together, it's actually 
all the argument you really need to keep the residency requirement. Because if the city has a total of 685 employees on the city side and only 82 of them have moved out of the city, then what does that say about our city? It says that people that live here and work here like to live here, even though they don't have to. So why not give them the opportunity to learn about the city and live here and pay into the environment so we can build a community? I just don't understand why anyone would ever even think about getting rid of it. It seems actually like a class warfare that's going on that you hear a lot about where people that have attained a certain level of education, and I've graduated from college, so I'm going to speak to it, kind of look down on people that don't necessarily have college requirement jobs. And they need to try to make everything well, Mr. to Chairman, this standard. Mr. Chairman, uh, so I've put this forward, um, and so I'm certainly not proposing. Is that a moment I'm of not proposing. Excuse me. For Excuse point of information, Mr. Chairperson, um, I put this um, resolve forward, and I'm certainly not promoting any kind of class warfare. In fact, my, one of my concerns about a residency requirement is that, in fact, that those who uh, are, are paid the least and probably have the least level of education are forced to abide by a law that others who have more educational attainment and higher incomes may not have to uh, adhere to. So it's, in some That's respects, it's just the opposite, just a point of information. Thank, Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we don't have to agree on everything, Mr. Stewart. I understand, Councilor Stewart. That, so I don't, and this isn't in any way meant toward you. It's just a point of information. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. this Chairperson. isn't meant toward you at all. I see it as a way to try to over-professionalize positions and you're taking opportunity away from people, blue-collar workers, which Brockton is full of, and you're giving them to people that are only minorly more qualified for the job. When you can be helping people that live in your city, the people that elect us all here, and giving them a foot up. And just because historically in the city, there definitely needs to be more um, work done on expanding the number of minorities and people of different ethnicities that get jobs in the city. That has to be done. But getting rid of or putting the residency requirement in any way in that vein is ridiculous when we have, when we have analysis by professionals that say the residency ordinance in cities that have high minority populations actually helps the city's employees to reflect the people that live in the community Point of information, more so. Mr. Chairperson. Um, well, why, why don't you just take the floor? I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, point of information. Um, so from my understanding from Ms. Cruz, uh, we don't have any data actually in terms of the impact of the residency law here in, in Brockton and um, citing some of the outside um, data actually doesn't reflect the reality of what's happening in the city at the moment, and even in terms of no, cultural racial diversity. We're not seeing that diversity in our, our uh, city staff uh, with the residency law in place. So, um, but I would, would like to um, suggest, and maybe this should come back as an ordinance actually, is that we try to capture some of this information uh, over a period of a year or two years uh, to, to determine what, what, um, what the intent of the residency law is and sort of try to track those measures to see if it's actually, uh, we're actually delivering on those expectations so that when we have these conversations, we actually have the data in place to say it, it is, it's achieving this goal. If the goal is diversity and staffing, let's look at that. If it's um, hindering those who may not have higher educational attainment, we can look at that data. If it's actually, the goal is to, um, to assess whether or not it's making employees higher performers. We can certainly look at performance reviews and compare it to those who live in the city and those who do not. But I'd like to um, have this resolve go back favorably um, to the full city council, but then I, I hope to then submit an order where we can sort of figure out what's the best way to capture the real data so we're not, um, um, so we're speaking with the facts, uh, Mr. President. Council, is that a motion? It is. Uh, prior to the motion, can I just? Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Council Stewart for bringing this forward, and I think there's a, a lot of things to talk about. Uh, personally, I've never been in favor of the residency, residency ordinance. However, it was voted in, and it was a binding referendum. It was not a non-binding referendum. It was a binding referendum. Well, and in fact, it was twice voted in by the voters. I think sometimes, like any referendum, there's 
not always a full understanding of the cost of it and the, the, uh, w what it would take, but uh, it costs the city a lot of money that we've already spent now to negotiate with the unions through these uh, many years. Um, and uh, again, I would be, I'd have a tough time voting to change it because it's been voted in by the voters, but I do think it's a, any law that uh, more than two-thirds of your employees are already exempt from by state law. Personally, I, I find that to be offensive. But uh, um, the one thing I think is very difficult to know because it was a, it's a binding, it's a referendum. What the intent of every voter is, is strictly they want the people to live. I mean, who, who can know what a voter is thinking when they go into a booth? When I look at some of us, I think, what the heck were they thinking when they went <laughs> into the booth? Uh, so obviously, I don't think we can ever know what the intent is other than the voters have said as a, as a majority that they want the people to work for the city to live in the city. Um, other than that, who knows what's in somebody's mind. So I don't, I don't think the intent other than that is really something we can, we can grasp. I think we can try to reach out and find out more, uh, find some studies, and, you know, Councilor Dubai, you know, was talking about a study there, but we don't even know who that was or whatever. We need to find out maybe, you know, what professional outfits out there have done some studies and, you know, where there is a, what the ups and downs are other than the fact that the voters have voted it in. And twice in Brockton they voted it in. So it's a, that's a pretty, pretty strong indictment against us changing it, even though I personally would like to see a change. I don't think it is a, a law that works very well. Um, but uh, I do want to thank you for bringing it forward because I think it's a discussion we need to have. Uh, I can tell you that uh, depending on what changes may be made in the DPW office, filling that position with a residency requirement with some very strong uh, academic credentials and uh, is going to be very, very difficult to get a real, the, the best candidate. I'm not saying there's nobody in Brockton that can do that job, but th on some of those kind of jobs, we are really handcuffing ourselves with the residency requirement. And uh, again, we heard from Ms. Cruz about many jobs where the, were ready to do interviews and people that were qualified and chosen to be part of that interview process chose not to come back. We don't always know why, but I think it's safe to say that when they had to sign the affidavit that they were going to move into the city within a year, they realized that's, that's not something I'm willing to do. So uh, I do thank you for bringing this forward. I think it is a discussion worth having, but uh, it, is, it has been voted in twice overwhelmingly by the people of Brockton, so that's a tough goal. Thank you, Councilor Cruz. Thank you, Councilor thank you. Cruz. On the motion, uh, Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to chime in as well, uh, if I could, because I, I think there's a... We, we tend to confuse, uh, I believe, the private sector with the public sector. And um, I hear comments being made how people drive into Boston, driving three, four hours to work into Boston and all the other issues that take place. But uh, this, is a, this is a public sector position. And I, uh, with all due respect to uh, the councillor from Ward 1, in a city that has 100,000 residents, uh, we have 2,000 plus employees working in this city. I find it hard to believe. I mean, I know doctors, lawyers, engineers. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll, I'll forward a name to the mayor for somebody that I think is more than qualified to assume the DPW position. I find it hard to believe that in this city, with all the, you know, we heard from Jason Barboza not too long ago, somebody that went on. <laughs> graduated through the school system, went on to college and came back, is now running his dad's business, which I believe is an $18 million uh, outfit. Um, we're not saying to Brockton Hospital, Stewart, and the Y, and some of these other uh, major employers in the community to enforce the residency law that the voters voted for back some years ago. We're saying that we need to do what we can, we, uh, the elected officials that people in this community entrusted us to be here. I, I know some of us probably don't belong up here, but you know, <laughs> we're here. Um, but they entrusted us to, to basically uh, do the, their bidding for them. And I honestly believe that we have to have a residency in place because the voters wanted it in place. If they choose not to have it in place, then maybe we can go out and they can go out and basically put in another referendum and, and change the law. Um, I believe in what uh, Councillor Stewart was trying to do is basically open up the discussion to basically look into what can we do from a city, st from a city standpoint to encourage or actually uh, bring in uh, more 
local residents into the, the workforce here in the city because it's, a, frankly, the way it is right now, it's a law that's not being enforced and enforced properly because of the of, with all the changes that we did uh, that's been made to it. But I, uh, honestly, Mr. Chairman, I honestly believe that, you know, something that passes 70 to 30, you know, who are we to stand here and, 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 and preach to the voters in this community that we're going to look into changing this. I think if, if, if the law needs to be changed, it needs to go back, it has to go back to the source of the law to have that changed. But I think we need to be very careful not to make a, a, a comparison between the private sector and the public sector. Boston has a strong residency law. Although people are working in Boston, they're not working for the city of Boston. If you're working for the city of Boston, you must live in Boston. And I think that's something that we need to kind of clarify because sometimes I think it gets kind of uh, mixed up and people sometimes say, oh, I work in Boston, it's not a problem. I work in New Bedford, I work in Providence or whatever the deal is. But if you're going to work for those municipalities, you're going to have to live in that municipality. So I honestly believe that if you're going to, you know, if we're good enough to pay you, we should be good enough to live with you. And if you don't, if you have a problem with that, then perhaps you ought to find em employment elsewhere. And that's the way I feel. And that's the way 70% of the voters in this community felt as well, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank, thank you, you Councillor. Councillor, there's been a motion made. I don't know if it was seconded. Okay. Motion was made Can properly seconded. On the motion? Yes, please. On Can I motion. have a roll call vote on this? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Madam Clerk, we're going to take a roll call vote. Motion's been made properly seconded for Thank a favorable you. recommendation to the full City Council. ASAC? Shirley ASAC? Could yes. you restate the question? Please. Motion's been made for favorable recommendation to the full City Council, correct? Correct. correct. It's been properly seconded. So this is just like we've done countless times tonight. It's a favorable recommendation to the full City yes. Council. Shana Barnes. Yes. Timothy Cruz. Yes. Dennis Tanapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. No. Dennis Aranieri. No. Tom Monahan. Yes. Moises Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. Yes. Paul Studensky. Uh, Robert Sullivan. Yes. Nine yeays, two nays. Motion carries. Uh, Councillors, uh, before we conclude the evening, uh, two point, points of information. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you. All 11 members appeared last Thursday night at the first joint meeting, uh, which yeah, was this body, uh, the Mayor really Carpenter, uh, wearing two hats, the Mayor and also Chair of the School Committee. Um, all the School Committee members were there, minus one, and the two Brockton representatives. It was very long. Uh, we're going to cut that down. The Mayor and I had lunch last Friday. I've spoken to uh, Tom Minicello as well. Um, but you know what? For the first meeting, I think it was appropriate. We're going to iron out some of the wrinkles, but it was great. So I want to thank each and every one. It's never happened in the history of Brockton. I think a lot of discussion uh, was beneficial that night, and we'll continue to do that. The next one will be in May. It's going to be at the East Middle School, and we'll, we'll get a definitive date. Another point of information I want to uh, tell you and the Brockton residents, because I think it's extremely important. As president of the Brockton City Council, under Section 23-30A of the City Ordinances, I have the ability, if there's an opening, to appoint members to the Water Commission. As of this date, I have the ability to appoint one member. Uh, thus, at this time, I'm going to respectfully ask each and every one of you and anybody watching or anybody here in the chamber tonight, if you are interested in this uh, possible appointment, I'm going to ask you to please forward a letter of uh, interest and resume uh, to my attention through the clerk's office here at City Hall, 45 School Street in Brockton, 02301. I am unfortunately going to have to make a deadline of one week from today, and people might say, why is that? Well, one week from today is Tuesday, the 25th of February. Uh, it needs to be at 4.30, which is the close of City Hall. Reason being is two days after that, on the 27th, there will be a water rate hearing, and uh, we need to have a member in place uh, by that time. So um, if you know anybody, any friends, family, constituents, residents, anybody watching, and you do have an interest, bear in mind two things. The term is three years. It's a volunteer, non-paid position. Um, the other thing that's important of information is the uh, City of Brockton's Water Commission meets typically at 9.30 in the morning on the second Monday uh, of the month. So if you're a schedule, work schedule, or if you're a retiree, uh, if you're interested in this, by all means, please send your letter of interest and a resume through the city clerk's office to my attention. Again, the deadline's going to be one week from today, Tuesday, the 25th of February at 4.30 p.m. 
Anything else Mr. before Chairman, us? Mr. Chairman, may I have a moment of personal privilege? Absolutely. I just want to announce that I'm having a Ward 6 community meeting on February 26th. Mm -hmm. That is a Tuesday evening. It will start at 7 p.m. and it will be at the Brookfield School. So February 26th, it is a Wednesday evening at the Brookfield School. Thank, Thank you, you, Council. Council uh, Monaghan. Uh, yes, just a, uh, we just finalized uh, <coughs> the uh, Mass for St. Patrick's Day will be held on March 15th, Saturday, March 15th, I think it's 10 a.m., at St. Patrick's Church. I'll get, give you more information as we get close to that date. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, Councilor Isaac. I would like to announce my first um, ward meeting on Thursday, March 13th at Fuller Craft Museum at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. It's a ward 7 meeting. Well, anything else before us, Councilors? Seeing none, uh, drive safely. This meeting's adjourned.